If you order a Bl Bloody Mary, you're totally cool. But if you order a Heineken at 7 a.m., alcoholic. Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bottle of a beer at 7 a.m. I mean, a Bloody Mary. Well, that's a morning drink. Uh, I'll have five mimosas. He's not a big drinker. Can I have half a bud? Alcoholic! 100%. Hey, guys. Brand new episode of Two Bears, One Cave. Tom's at the doctor's getting his testosterone levels checked. And uh, they were off. They're really high. And he started... His testicles shrivel back up, so they're going to try to regulate them and keep them. So he's on TRT. Oh, he's on everything. He's on. He is like he is the most genetically engineered stand-up comedian. So is if he, you thought Joe Piscopo took it too far, Tom Segura is taking it. So way So Tom too far. hides it. There's no tight shirt. There's no. Oh shirt. no! No 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 no! Is he with his shirt off too? Oh no! <laughs> never no. See, Tom didn't have like I have superior genetics where my body. Uh, my body, as big as it even gets, I still look good. I still look like, oh, wow, you, you don't look that bad. He looks like a dad. Right, exactly. Tom, at a very young age, his body fell apart, and he's been trying to repair it and get it back up. You ever see that house Money Pit with Michael Keaton? Yes. That's Tom's body. And so, <laughs> Well, the thing is, if you're organically a little guy, look at my wrists. Yeah. Look How much do you weigh? You've never been fat. Uh, my heaviest was like 159 after doing Trapped oh, in Paradise. Oh, oh, oh. I've fucked that are 159. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I've crapped things that are 159 pounds, ladies I've and gentlemen. 159 pounds on top of me riding me. <laughs> so I keep track of this stuff. So I go on the machine, the bio. They say that I my lean mass is 113 and I'm carrying 34 pounds of fat at 147. I don't know if that's accurate. Well, I I'm, just, pr I'm pretty ripped. My, I'm I'm one. I, my, my lean mass is one fifty six. Jesus, Christ. And so I'm carrying a hundred pounds at six six one. Hmm. So you're carrying a hundred pounds. But the thing pounds. is, it's husky guys are naturally like a big frame. Yeah, can kind of get bigger. And it looks okay. Feel, when a I, little yeah. guy gets a pot belly and little shoulders, yes, it's kind of like you can't shave your head if you have no chin and a baby face. You have to have Jason Stratham. You have to have Bruce Willis. Yeah, you but, you you have you have a baby face. And you've never had a beard until recently, right? Well, my wife got tired of fucking Howdy Doody. I mean, it, let's face it. Though for a long time, I you know you could pull up pictures of me on uh, one of the boys when I was twenty seven. I was when I went to high racing school, with the moon. Racing with the moon. One of my favorite movies ever. And I honestly, I've been racing with that haircut. I wanted Sean Penn's haircut in that movie my whole fucking life. So my whole fucking life. Here's the story of that, because I know we share our love of flying. I fly SFO to do the movie. Yeah. Somehow I got cast. They thought I was pithy. So Michael, who's, who's the guy? Michael Matson. He was, yeah, Michael Matson. Yeah, Michael Matson. We're both getting on a single engine plane. And there, it's the thing where they're taking the luggage 1984. off. 1984. This is, yeah. And we're going to fly up to Napa together. That's the oh first time God. I met him. Is that where they shot that in Napa? Yeah. God damn it. And I got on and we went right over San Francisco. Like, a, it seemed like 100 feet over the pyramid. So we came <laughs> in and I went into the trailer and they butched my hair. And I saw Sean. I go, what about Sean? Isn't he in the army? And it was the coolest, <laughs> the coolest hair fucking haircut ever. It was the coolest haircut. And this is young pre-Madonna Sean Penn, I think. Oh, yeah. He was a complete uh, kind of boy toy. Yeah, there it's, I am. It's, it's random well, what movies you see that live a, live a, like leave something on you that you remember forever. Mm -hmm. It's about two guys who are getting ready to join the military. Yeah. And, uh, and Sean Penn's whole thing is he's trying to fall in love with M McGovern. Elizabeth, Elizabeth McGovern, McGovern yes. who by the way, can I tell you, can I tell you my heart breaks for <laughs> all of those beautiful women that lived in the old Hollywood industry yeah. where mm -hmm. they were uh, like, I, I, I mean this, but like all the beautiful girls that were in all the animals out of Sandler movies that did one movie, then married Pete Sampras did one movie, then married, you know, like, right. Like who they did she marry? Pete Sampras. Abby Gilmore, I think married Pete, Elizabeth Pete Sampras. Elizabeth McGovern. Okay. No, no, Elizabeth, I don't know. Oh. Pull up on Elizabeth McGovern now. Oh. Elizabeth Gutherman is gorgeous. Yeah, so they marry a superstar athlete or something, and then they just don't get work. Yeah, well, I mean, it's because the, the mm -hmm. they were single-serving actresses at the time. They got one big thing, and only a couple of them, like Julia Roberts, she yeah. still looks fucking good. She still mm -hmm. looks fucking good. I, you know, yeah. I, I know that I've I've aged properly with women because I find. Like, we're going to Oslo tomorrow. I saw your touring schedule. I yeah. looked it up this morning. It's fucking wild. It's insane. I mean, just the the history of where you're going. Berlin, Oslo, and you're selling out. You can't say that. I can say it. 
Uh, oh, you can? Yeah, I, guess yeah, so. I have no ego. Because when I interviewed Paul <laughs> McCartney, I realized later, he can't say, well, I wrote Strawberry Fields as well, the little part. He, if he says it, he's an asshole. <laughs> but if I go, who wrote that other part, yeah. you know, in Strawberry yeah. Fields? I just sort of the middle eight, you know, he gets stuck. John will get stuck. Yeah. And I get a little cold in there and we sort of ride it. I love doing that because I, I feel like I get to visit Paul. Yeah. Because my voice is just a rough ride. I did a reading yesterday, so it's a little bit raw. What was your reading for? Uh, a script I wrote, Idiots and Monsters. It's oh, yeah? sort of Tropic Thunder meets oh, the, the Three Stooges you or have, something. You have me at Tropic Thunder. That's my, uh, one of my favorite fucking movies ever. That kind of genius. Tom Cruise in that fucking movie. You know? Tom Cruise is worth every fucking penny. Best line in the movie? What? Tom Cruise. I want you to take one step back and literally fuck your face. <laughs> Wasn't that the line? Yeah. You can yeah. look it up. Fuck your own face. Uh, ben Stiller is brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, yeah. Fucking Danny McBride's great in that. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, Danny McBride's that great first in that. time I saw The him. British guy who's like, when right when his head blows off, and he's like, oh, yeah. I think right here. But then, you know, again, the other mic drop of all time, for what I like when Tarantino does, inexplicability, lines that are so densely beautiful and, and politically incorrect in this case. But yeah. he goes, you went, you know, when you get an Oscar, you can't go total retard. Yeah. You know that thing? <laughs> you went full retard. Yeah. That's why you came home empty handed. Yeah. Which is true. In almost every movie, it's corduroy slacks that are too short. Yeah. Like every, Sean Penn got an Oscar. I go, no, they're not going to do the too short <laughs> pants. Can someone lengthen the motherfucker's pants? <laughs> and a funny haircut. Don't they have people guarding them or helping them, giving them a trip? Funny haircut, pants way too short. Now give me a fucking Oscar. But they, that that movie was awesome. Did you ever see Rosie? I could o talk about that the rest of the podcast. I could talk about Rosie that Rosie O'Donnell? Did you ever see Rosie O'Donnell and, and My Sister Rides the Bus? What's it called? It's, <laughs> it's, 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 Rosie, time. it's, it's so bad. It's so bad. And I'm, by the way, I'm a fan of every comic, like every comic I'm a fan of. You That's, probably know them intimately, but like, no, I'm always a fan of Rosie. I'm always a fan of Ellen. Everyone trashes him. I go, yeah, but they're a comic. That's where my brain goes. That's the one where you think of like the mayor and the president of show business. When I came through, it was Leno and Seinfeld. Yeah. And they both said, you know, what he's doing this. You got to respect them. You yeah. Know? They're not snobbed. Like, no, Ken and Tom's getting like five laughs a minute. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I think he's fine. Anyway, I, I'm just going to do voices all day because no one does them anymore. So it's, <laughs> no, by the way, you're amazing at it. I can't do uh, any, kind of. I can't do, I was doing a, a I, I could show I'm, you. Cause I'm in Dublin and I got this uh, suit. And so I put on the a suit this morning. A little bit of Irish. And I was, and I was like, hello. <laughs> Oh, out top, top of the morning. That's not Irish, is it? No, that's more. I, the easiest way to go is like Cockney, and I could go Michael K with you. Yeah, you just go get a head coat. Okay, uh, get a head coat. Go uh, up here. Go up here with your hand. Go up uh, with your hand. All right. And then you're gonna not yet, but you're gonna walk down the stairs. So you are up here like this. You're bloody crazy, and then you go down the stairs. So you're, you're up bloody here. Crazy. You're bloody crazy, and, and then, then you go. go down, down the, the steps. steps. I've needed That's you my whole good. fucking life. I mean, you know, I'm so bad at fucking accents. No, there is technique. I'm so yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I hear them and then I try to do them and it always turns into a Swedish dude. Yeah, I know what you mean. I couldn't do Australian for the longest time. When, when I see Kevin Pollack do Shatner, Kevin I mean, I'm in Pollack awe of people, so fucking good. but I love throw, just throwing my voice. My favorite thing I thought on the way over here was, well, fly on the wall is in the top 10 in a regular basis on Apple. <laughs> Ratings so long, morbid. Time for an autopsy. Farewell to Bears One Cave. Maybe you need more bears and more caves. So long, Conan. You need downloads, not more friends. <laughs> So that's extrapolated from Arnold Schwarzenegger oh. into Hans and Franz, then into this guy who's yeah. very fey and I superior. Love that guy. Yeah, I do too. It's so superior. <laughs> so long, call your daddy. Farewell, Dak Shepard. Sorry, you already had Ellen on talking about how she was molested. You're, run <laughs> you're running out of tragedies. <laughs> But we won't run out of Saturday Night Live, guess. Uh, anyway, so um, you've done no, so many. Like 
You know what's so funny? We have this move with friends. What's that? If you're like at Vegas or something, just this, before you drink it, you go like that and lean it over. <laughs> but nobody else starts. You go like this. So anyway, guys, yeah, later on, we're going to get the jet skis, the whole thing, you know, and then you go like that. That's it. My brother in Vegas. Guys, hold on. That's the guy also all on those camping trips would have beef jerky. And for a thousand times in a row, he would go, jerk? And that made him laugh every time. Wait, where did you grow up? Uh, in hell. <laughs> Psychotic dad, codependent mom, made me her surrogate father. Five kids, three older brothers beat the shit out of me. Little sister was crazy. It was a hard drive and hard drinking Carvies. We are out of our minds. Really? Out of our minds. 60s kids, rag ragamuffin. Where? Where? Well, Montana originally. For real? I'm from Missoula. Yeah, yeah. Hey, it's a, Shut the fuck you know, up. Tell you, hey, don't get shy on me. You know, it's just a mountain place. You know what I'm no, it is hip to be from Missoula. It's but then, cool as shit. But then I grew up in just white, middle-class suburbia south of San Francisco, San Carlos. Oh, yeah? Yeah, now it's Silicon Valley. Our track home they bought for 25000 Now it's worth $3 million. Missoula, the big M. My parents Dude. went to school there. My brother went to school there. I was just in Montana this summer. I was mm -hmm. in Montana. I was just in Montana as well. I love Montana. Western Montana in the summer is God's country. Yeah. I mean, it's just crazy. Did you have that kind of river runs through at childhood? Well, we went there every summer. And we went to Lake Ronan off Flathead Lake. Yeah. And we had the rowboat and the fishing and all that. Yeah, my father really related to river runs through it. That was kind of his his era of being a little kid in Montana. Really? Yeah. That was amazing. Cause your dad grew up in Montana. Yeah. Totally. So he was like, a and man. my mom, he was like a man. Uh, yeah, it was the sixties and he was like that. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to cry. So one, oh. one, what we would do was like, when I was five, I got up and I took a shit, right? I don't really wear blue, but I am now. <laughs> I'm on the right <laughs> podcast. Man, am I in the right place. So there was no toilet paper. I think I was probably four. So I just took a hand towel, but then I put it back because I'm like three and a half or four. Yeah. So my dad found it, so it was whipping time. <laughs> so you had to go to his room and get his belt. Any kid who was getting a whipping, and he would snap it really loud. Yeah. And then you had to grab your ankles, and then the, he would ask everyone how many. They get in a circle. No. And then as he beat you, he'd say, you're going to cry, you're going to cry. But, you know, it was just a, a quick whipping, you know. What'd you have? You, 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 your wait, new wait, nickname. Wait, wait, wait. You realize this is how traumatized I am by hearing that story. Why are you traumatized? Your new nickname is Silver Spoon. I knew you had a weak, easy childhood by looking at you. You're too Damn. nice. Damn. Where's Damn. the anger? Fucking... Where's you the anger? your ankles and everyone sits around. Yeah. Two, three. Oh, Jesus Christ, you're going to, God damn it, you fucking, yeah. So that was, he'd beat you and yell at you. Or he'd give us, one time my sister, she was five and she was fussing over oatmeal. So he took a hot bowl of steaming oatmeal and just put it on her head. So she's three, I'm five. So I remembered that. So I kind of hit it. you're like, oh. yeah. I mean, it was, my brother Mark uh, was 18. I was probably 10. He decided to try beer. So he had 10 Heinekens at a picnic party <laughs> and then drove home Dad's Hillman, a used British sedan. It was covered in pink popcorn because he had 10 Heinekens and a bunch of pink popcorn. I don't know how he made it home, but he covered the inside of it. So my dad was like, oh, Jesus Christ, you're drinking? You're drinking? He's sitting on the bed. So my dad starts unloading on my left and a right. My mom's like, you're killing him. You're killing him. And then my brother didn't feel a thing. My dad broke his wrist on his skull with the first punch. So he, he had a cast. He had a cast when people come over. We had to say he bumped it on a table. Oh, my God. But then he goes, oh, oh clean up the pink popcorn. So Scott and I had to go in there and just wipe things off oh. for an hour. Yeah. Holy shit. It was a, well, I, I, had, I had a Disney face for a long time. Yeah. And I kind of smile a lot. So people go, easy childhood. You know? Yeah. I always say a really, you know, people get on stage, come on, man, I'm so depressed. I'm barely making it, man. Nobody gets out of their apartment. Nobody drives to the comedy club. Nobody yeah. leans on the mic and it's pithy. If they're yeah. really anxious and yeah. really depressed. Yeah. A lot of these movie stars, because it's become a fetish to have anxiety. I get terrible anxiety, man. Yeah. I'm sorry, gang. He's, you know, they've done like five movies in the last 18 months. Nobody does that. Anyway, don't get me started. No, that's But I love your, why did that trigger you? Oh, because the beating? no, because uh, the reality of it, mm -hmm. like there's a, the, I, I'm doing it so in a funny way. The thing, no, no, no. Yeah. But, but the idea that like, 
we had dads. My dad uh, would raise his voice and yell, and my dad would take it here. My dad would also, uh, he would say things that were brutally fucking honest that would hurt you. Uh, to to, but like, but, and and my parenting was fucked up because I thought the mm. way to parent in a in a bad situation was to raise your voice and lose your shit. Really? Yeah, I thought that because that's how he did it, and it worked for me. Right. So you felt like you never felt like he was just kind of torturing you a little bit to get off himself. Right. I felt like I felt like like he would lose his shit. T- send me to my room as an adult, as like an, a 16 year old, send me to my room and tell me I was a fucking moron, but I'm a very self-correcting person. Mm-hmm. So I would sit in my room and try to figure out, I was taught that taught me to figure out why I was wrong. So in, in return, right. I'm a really good partner in a relationship because I try to figure out why I fucked up. Your side of the street, as they call it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, and, totally. And so yeah. I thought I could do that with my kids. That's not how that works. Well, there's a little thing called 2023. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. it has nothing to do. Yeah. We came through, my wife and I came through with our kids right when everyone kid gets a trophy. And so oh, this was- real. Oh, yeah, you have a 30-year-old, right? Yeah. So it's mid-90s and a lot of, we're just kind of in this little school and the kids show up for soccer and they get a big box. It's the first day of practice. Wait, were you rich when you had kids? No. So when, when did you start? Oh, when, we had, when I had kids. Yeah. In Wait, relative who, terms. Who's yeah. the other person? Well, I thought when, when I grew up. Was oh, I no, oh, no, yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. For In my terms, I was. Absolutely. So we wait, how old is, so your oldest kid is 30? 31 and 31. 29. So then yeah. you had kids, oh, probably like in, 30, 36 in the late 90s. And 38. Late 90s? Early 90s. Early 90s. Yeah. Okay. So Wayne World's out there. Wayne's World's out there. I did a couple ridiculous movies because I had a rescue complex with my whole family. Like, you know. I was very close to my brothers because we were, we survived the Boer Wars, yeah. you know, with daddy. So it made us all like, you know, we check on each other. Yeah. Am I exaggerating? No. I said to my sister last year, I go, am I misremembering or did dad have it in for me? That was the expression. <laughs> she goes, oh, no, Dane, he had it in for you. He had it in for you. So he just, I tweaked in the wrong way. My mother called me precious. I had a baby face, completely androgynous looking, but I never respected him. So he never dinged me. Because he would he would scream when he threw up. Really? We'd hear in the back room, oh! And I go, what a fucking baby screaming when he's throwing up. <laughs> Breaking news. Manscaped isn't just about your dick and asshole. Right now, they're selling beard products. That's right. They've gone from waist to face to help you replace that bulky razor with their brand new Beard Hedger Pro Kit. Manscaped help you get the golden rod of a Greek god, and now they've created the best tools for you to turn heads with a clean, perfectly groomed and conditioned beard. Finally, tame your mane by going to manscaped.com and using our code BEARS for 20% off plus free shipping. Look at this shit. Huh? What? Hmm. Huh. Beard Pressure Pro Kit, baby. It all starts with the Beard Hedger. First off, this waterproof cordless trimmer has a rotary wheel that gives you 20 hair cutting lengths all with one guard. So you don't have to take them off and put them on and lose them. No more messy drawer full of extras and add-ons. The kit also includes a titanium coated tea blade, beard shampoo and conditioner, beard oil, beard balm, and three free gifts. So get 20% off and free shipping with our code bears at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use our code bears, the Manscaped Beard Hedger Pro Kit, the premier solution to face grooming. This new year, you've got goals and factors here to help you achieve each and every one of them. Fuel up fast with ready-to-eat nutritious meals delivered straight to your door, leaving you time and energy to tackle everything on your to-do list. Achieve and maintain your 2023 goals with Factor. Get America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit and start saving time eating well and living your best year yet. We just got a package delivered to our house with incredible ingredients. These are 34 chef prepared, dietitian approved weekly options. There's always something new to try. Plus, you can round out your meal and replenish your snack supply with an assortment of 36 plus sweets, smoothies, juices, and more satisfying add ons. Get Factor and enjoy clean eating without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor packed meals delivered to your door. Ready in just two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head 
to factormeals.com slash bears50 and use the code bears50 to get 50% off your first box. That's code bears50 at factormeals.com slash bears50 to get 50% off your first box. Anyway, what was it? <laughs> <laughs> he had it in for you. He had it in for me. So, but... Those days, it was very different. So when we came through, I did these two shitty movies. We go, well, I, my career's over. Let's just move. Wait, what were the two shitty movies? Uh, Clean Slate. Okay. Horrible. I'm trying to think. I've seen all. I've, the thing is, I've seen Horrible. everything you've done. Uh, like when you, I, was talk, I was listening to you on a podcast, and you talked about doing a movie with Burt Lancaster and, uh, and uh, Kirk Tough Dun Guys. Tough Kirk Guys. Dunley. Yeah, I saw well, that movie. That was a thrill. Yeah. yeah. There's a story to that. There it was. Clean Slate. Yeah. Oh, my God. Look at you. Yeah, they tried to, I know, <laughs> that's a long time ago. That was a, a few beers and a lot of sun. <laughs> uh, so, so you did these two movies, Clean Slate and... And it was, a, it was a classic mistake. And it's just that you can't, when you leave SNL, ideally you do something that's pretty close to what you did on SNL. Mm -hmm. So Wayne's World was on SNL. So that yeah. was fine. But then, you know, they offered me $3 million to do this. I didn't have that much money at that point in, rel in net terms. Mm -hmm. So I go, well, I can just go do that. And, you know, directors seem nice. You know, you, I. Did you think you, in a way you'd fix it when you got there? Like you read the script, you're like. I, I had no idea. Those two movies, both directors got on their knees and begged me. In, really? the, in the office. The other one was Road to Wellville? Yeah, no, Road to Wellville was okay. That was Alan yeah, Parker. I saw Road to Wellville. That was that was a trip. That's about the uh, Nabisco? Uh, beginning, beginning of Kellogg's. Kellogg's. And, and, Kellogg, and that yeah. was a trip because I spent a lot of time. And here's a little bit of a story that still when I think about. Spent a lot of time with Anthony Hopkins. So really? everybody was blasted every night. <laughs> everybody. Yeah. And it was, you know, John Cusack. It was Broderick. They go out because... The first day I met Bridget Fonda, she goes, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm, I'm going to get out of this acting and film. Really? And she was obsessed. There I was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I played the crazy uh, ne'er-do-well son. So that was actually kind of fun. Bridget was obsessed with Henry Fonda her, uh, and Jimmy Stewart. Well, Henry Fonda was her grandfather. Yeah. But she wouldn't let me do Henry Fonda for her. She goes, don't do grandpa. Don't go grandpa. Oh my God, that's her grandfather. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, shut the fuck up. Because one time we're, we were doing a scene and she turned away and I she looked up and I heard her say, help me, grandpa. Like she felt like she forgot how to act. So I just come in there and I try to tell her just to hit the mark and say her lines. <laughs> and there's nothing better than just doing what you're supposed to do. And she hated that. <laughs> Obsessed with Jimmy Stewart, favorite sexy movie star. So we watched really? this A Wonderful Life and- I did all. I would do that for her a lot. Yeah, yeah. And so when so that that said, everyone just partied. The way I think it was just normal film stuff. When you're a puppet to a director and you have your lines and you two lines a day, you just go to the pub. You go to the place. Yeah. But so Anthony Hopkins and I started talking. So we bonded over. He's heard the stories you just heard. We bonded over you know, our dads and stuff. And also he was an impressionist, like Sammy Davis Jr. was. Really, Anthony Hopkins. He would he would do Hannibal Lecter and I would do Garth and we would do that every day for the crew. Get away from big scary man. Come here, Garth. <laughs> so can you imagine? Every day we'd start the we start fun. the scene before we go. So then he was kind of, he's shy, but I started talking to him, relating to him. Last day of film, I mean, he very shyly said to me, reminded me of Robin Williams a little way in the shyness. Yeah. He goes, Oh, maybe you want to come into my um trailer for lunch you know and i go i'd love to and then unbeknownst to me the pr woman came up and said you've got entertainment tonight at lunch i go well i'm gonna go to anthony's well they're just here and you gotta do that and everyone say it, you know yeah so i was like fuck i can't do it so i had to tell him and tell him. and then his assistant told me later she goes i've been with him 10 years he never asked anyone into his trailer for lunch oh fuck boom but I ran into him years later. He's just a sweet guy and yeah. so brilliant. But the the director melted. I was there when he melted. I, really? Well, we're in Mohonk. It's a haunted hotel upstate New York. Really? Mohonk house. Yeah. I'm in a room with Alan Parker, the British director, really too cool for school, did some brilliant movies. And the way to make that movie work, they wanted Anthony Hopkins to be Anthony Hopkins. Straight, super real. Because it was about pooing and that, yeah. you know, yeah. straight line. He came in and he goes... I had a dream I was the king of the vegetables. So he had these grotesque buck teeth, which you could bring them up, that he put in 
he's like he like he's a rabbit because it was about vegetables. Yeah. So he played the whole thing with these giant buck teeth. <laughs> you can, yeah, there they are. <laughs> yeah. So he was funny rather yeah, yeah, than serious, yeah. Yeah. and I think that was a difficult thing. But anyway, he's such a sweet guy. I've, I've, I've followed so much of this story in history. Oh yeah. Uh, I, I've I've listened to podcasts about it. This this the whole road to Wellville, the the. Yeah, it's because it's 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 not Nabisco. It's uh, Quaker Oats and Kellogg and Kellogg, and, and, the and, and they stole yeah. they stole the recipe because the guy who created it didn't want the world to have it. He didn't want to make cereals. He was like, no, 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 no. I'm about this place. And his brother worked for him, and his, didn't respect his brother. Mm -hmm. And his brother took it. I've, I, it's so funny. I, I saw this movie, and it was my one connection with the story. But, but so, what was the other movie you did that you didn't that would didn't clean well, slate? That what? one was okay. That's clean great. clean slate. Trapped in Paradise. Oh my was, God! Was, Trapped in Paradise with right. fucking the well, fucking three with you, Nick Cage, and uh, John Lovitz. John Lovitz, yeah, it's a great fucking movie. Well, um, that's a great fucking movie. There was so much left on the, so I decided to do Mickey Rourke as a, <laughs> as the character because I went to dailies and I saw, hey, we're in a cartoon. It was written for it was written for Pesci. De Niro and like Ray Liotta or something. Are you serious? Yeah. Are you? And they serious? turned it down, so they got Nicolas Cage and then me and Love It. So they they were kind of playing it straight. So I just said we're in a cartoon because I went to dailies. I did kind of a guy like this. I don't know what you're doing, but what are you doing? He's kind of a dumb guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, just gotta gig him this kind of thing. So I was just having fun with it, but they left so much on the cutting room floor that I tried to get in the editing room, which I did in Wayne's World One. Yeah. You know? And I couldn't, I couldn't save it in the editing. Oh, but, I love that movie. It's crazy. The movies that yeah. I theoretically are successful or make money or make everyone money and that are big hits sometimes aren't the movies that are your favorite movies growing up. Right. We're like, like Trapped in Paradise. I watched that movie. I think I watched it in the movie theater and then watched it again. Like that's a, that I, it's so funny because I think there's so many movies that are now similar to that where one killer is stuck in a town. Right. Where yeah. they get snowed in, you know? Well, it, it, it had all the elements. Nicolas Cage is one of the funniest people I've ever met. Of course, love it. And we were wandering around in the snow, like 20 below. And lunch was at 1 a.m. Oh, because we're working all night. Yeah. Lunch, you know? So we're walking, we're in this little town. And we look up and it's a movie that Nicolas Cage and Indy Film had done. And they were coming out and he goes, hey, could you uh, open the theater and show it to us? So Nicholas, you know, at lunchtime, I have a bottle of red wine and then yeah. we would watch because all we all after lunch, all we do is fall down in the snow. There was yeah. anyway, we had one line. What are yeah. you doing? <laughs> you know, so, yeah, we watched a movie with him. It, it's trippy stuff. But basically, they didn't make money. They didn't do box office for all the reasons. And there was a lot of it, I would have cut it much, much different. Let it play and all that stuff. But but you got the stuff in, in Wayne's World. Wayne's World one, especially I got to kind of. Penelope Spheres would just say, what are you going to do here? Because I- Is that the director? Yeah. It's so funny. I, I thought you guys directed it. Like well, I figured, I figured I, when you when you think of that movie, you just figure it's so you guys. Well, to your point, she didn't really direct me in that sense. Yeah. She was keeping things moving and I would kind of respectfully put my second banana shtick in here and there. Yeah. But then she would say, I would do my thing and she'd go, well, can you do it- you know, 10 seconds faster. That would be the only direction. Oh, wow. Yeah, because we'd vetted them on SNL. Myers did them in Canada. He knew what he was doing. And oh, yeah. we were kind of co-directing the whole thing in that way. As far as performance, we knew exactly what we were doing. It's crazy that, I, I, tell me if I heard this correctly, but that was a, like, I'm really bad at like uh, difficult questions. So, because I, I don't like competition. The, uh, no, ask me anything, by the way, and say anything to me. Um, no, <laughs> but I heard that like you and Mike Myers weren't like best friends when you started doing the sketch, and then you got a movie, and all of a sudden you guys are thrust into this partnership where it wasn't like you guys were, it wasn't like you guys were like Spade and Farley, who were actually best friends. No, I mean, because it is, it was Wayne's world. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, he brought it in. And so, um, I, you know, the, uh, you know, it just, it just grew and grew and grew. And we had no defined thing in terms of doing a movie because I started laughing a lot because Garth didn't have many lines in the sketch. So yeah. he was kind of, all Mike said was you worship Wayne, super supportive. So be like all this stuff going yeah. on, you know? Yeah. 
And because he had a brown wig, I just went walk through and grabbed the blonde one and put on the nerd glasses. Like I was going to do him like my brother Brad, or, you know, yeah. who talks like this. And then when we got in the movie, when you wait, did you remember the first sketch you did of Wayne's World? Yeah, it was just over in the corner in 8H. We had the set and it was Wayne's World, Wayne's World. I'm not sure who our guest was, but it was like, it's too close up. It's all that. Yeah. Mike was really good at catchphrases and rituals of things that you do, yeah. you know? And so it was all that. And it didn't kill initially, you know? And then it just kept growing and growing and growing until it was a killer sketch. We had Madonna, we did a film on it. And then the film came up and it was like, well, what is this? Is this old school Lauren Michaels? Did Lauren Michaels produce it? Yeah. And so well, Lauren Michaels produced it. Does it, is it, I'm, I'm assuming, this is by the way, really inside baseball, but I'm assuming just because I know the business that it's one of those things that, I heard back in the day that, or today, you can't make money on SNL. When you audition, you have to sign a contract before you audition. Yeah, I, I did it. Same yeah. thing. I didn't and, and, make money on it, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And so, do you, can you make money on Wayne's World? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah? yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah we yeah, got yeah. <laughs> a oh, yeah. mill for that one and many millions for the second one. <laughs> and we own, because there were no gross players, it's Hollywood stuff, that I think me, Lauren, and Mike, we, we all had 10% of Wayne's World won. 10%. And that, since there were no gross players crowding it out, movies made for twelve million and made like two hundred over two hundred worldwide. It was you know, made for twelve million, I think, or thirteen. Wow, wow, you know, wow. we did it in like thirty days. Part of the reason it was good because we didn't think it'd be a hit. And we're just flying through it. You yeah. Know? So we we got paid for that one, and that first one came out really nice. It was in Penelope did let us into the editing room, Mike and I, yeah. because the Foxy Lady scene wasn't going to make it. Because it was the twenty first hour of the thing, yeah, and the initial cut um, was all over the place, and so she let me go in and kind of fix it, you yeah. Know? So um, that was that was satisfying. So that That's was good. Great. But after that, then I'm doing Clean Slate. I'm kind of doing a Jimmy Stewart character. So if it wasn't anything I did. And then I did the Dana Carvey show, mm -hmm. which was very cool. But that's a whole other story that yeah. bombed out, but then got a documentary and people said it was brilliant. You know, yeah. We had Louis, we had Colbert. I saw correct? the documentary. Yeah. So you know that story uh, in essence. And then I thought, well, career's kind of fading. I'll raise the kids up. And long story short, Northern California. Career's kind of fading. <laughs> You know, the one thing I doing fly on the wall and you're interviewing all these SNL people and you do basically just love comedians. And I love anyone who went on SNL in a way, just I do too. Just going through the gauntlet like that and, and hitting the marks and even some really big stars when you because Dave and I had no we had no plan like you you and Tom. Yeah. Let's just start talking, you know. And so I find myself wanting to give them, you know, some props because a lot of times they're like, Really? You know, like I said to Tom Hanks, when you, when you visited, I felt like we had another cast member when he would guest host. He goes, yeah, oh, that's so nice. So it's crazy that he there would... are arrogant people in show business, but yeah. most people need a hug and a pat on the back most of the time. Uh, yeah, you I know? agree. I <laughs> you know? agree. Like, hey, it's it's okay, you know, just to say, you know, you were a kick ass. That was so fucking funny. And we had Sherry O'Terry on and she just I love decimated us. I had I had yeah. wine with Sherry O'Terry one night. There's She's there's a really lot of there's funny. a lot of women even still and I go back to that old thing about Elizabeth McGovern but there's a lot of women on SNL that didn't I feel like generationally they were in the wrong generation to pop like Molly Shannon Sherry O'Terry um, uh, Rachel Dratch like I because I, now I look at the cast of SNL and it's so women heavy and they're so fucking good and they're all blowing up in such a because of I think progressive. I don't, I, mean, I don't know, but I think they're getting more opportunities well, than that, they ever have. Yeah, that is definitely what, what's happened, yeah. which is good. The other thing that's intrinsic is that when you would star in a movie in the 90s, <clears throat> minimum it'd be 20, 30 million or even a low budget film because they do the marketing and everything. Yeah. And then you'd come out in like 1,100 theaters or whatever, and then the box office would come out. Okay. Yeah. So if it was down, you were dinged. If you did two, you'd have to go back in line. Really? Now, coming off SNL now, you can go do a movie on Peacock Plus or Hulu, whatever. Yeah. No one gets the numbers. No one knows. Yeah. And you don't have any sense of having the carpet pulled out from under you. Pete Davidson. Yeah, it doesn't he matter. Did, he, did, uh, he did Staten Island. I think it's called Staten Island. Yeah. And I loved it. Low budget I loved it. indie. Low budget yeah. indie. I loved it. Was it, it was, in theaters? I, I don't think it made it to theaters. I think it just went straight to streaming. Yeah, and so then you just never know. So I think it's great. And then it's up to, like, uh, it's up to fans to decide whether or not they like you. And it's not, it's not up to the... To the industry to go, he's a failure. 
Right. And also who's going to come out the first weekend and all that kind of thing. You know? Yeah. So it was it's different. So now they do get to go out and do a lot of different things. The only thing is there's so many famous, unfamous people because of just, was, there's like, a billion people doing. There's a billion famous people that don't have talent. That you've never heard of. I've yeah, run yeah. into them on, they go, I'm on a show called, hey, I've had enough of, of you on CBS <laughs> on Tuesday. I've been on it 11 years. I had, I had someone say to me the other day, like there was, he was carrying himself odd. And I was like, I was like, oh, cool. I don't know the name of this. And I was like, I was like, this guy's definitely in something. You can tell by the, the, the yeah, way. Yeah, he's in, you can get an attitude. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had like a nice watch on and he called it out. And he was like, I was going to get that one. And I know how hard the watch is to get. And I was like, okay, this guy's got some. And I was like, so what are you doing? And he was like, I'm a working actor. I'm on suits or something or, or gray yeah, or right. something. Yeah. And I was like, oh, is, is that like, is that a, is that like, where's that at? Yeah, where do you get yeah, it? Yeah, and he was like, CBS. And I was like. Oh, okay. I don't. I don't watch. I don't watch CBS primetime. I don't watch yeah. anything but food shows in foreign languages on mute. <laughs> Why on mute? Because I, I don't know what they say anyway. Do you have so, subtitles on. Yeah, so I put on subtitles, and it's noodle yeah. shows. There's this one called uh, Mr. Wiggly, I think, and it's just about noodles in Asia. Ooh. I get it. I just call it brain candy. Anything that'll quiet yeah. your brain down. Yeah, you know? podcasts are big for me. Yeah. I listen to you on. I listen to you on Bill Maher. And I was, uh, it was one. Of, I was a, such a great fucking interview. Was it? Yeah. See, there, well, I'm, well, I'm yeah. doing the impression of the. Well, insecure. no, because you like. There's certain things that like you talked about because I knew that you liked running and you, and yeah. you talked about your um, carotid artery. Uh, Hundred percent blocked lower anterior descending. Lower heart. anterior. That's that's the, the one left, that got John Ritter. He he actually had a aorta dissection. That it oh, just thing ruptured. genetic, it just ruptured. That yeah. that's a motherfucker. Mine was just hundred percent blocked or ninety eight percent. And then you had the you got the stent in the nineties, right? Yes, I got a series of stents, which I think I mentioned that they they restenosed. My dad had that, and he did restenose. Uh, well, my dad had so my dad got a stent in his what in his widowmaker. That's the widowmaker is the lower anterior descending. Did it restenose or did it? I don't or, know. I'm gonna fucking call. What him. year did he get it? I can uh, tell you. My, uh, 50, 50, 50, 13 years ago, 15 years ago. Oh, then he has a, what they call a drug eluding stent. Okay. So those don't block up. So it reblocked up. It did anyway? It reblocked up to 99%. Hmm. And so he, let me just call him. He's, he'll, he'll, he loves this. By the way, this makes my dad's dick hard. If you talk I to him think about- You're either don't want to hear a thing or you're fascinated. I'm fascinated by the science of it. Uh, I'm So I just got I, my, I, yeah, oh, I got my carotid arteries checked. And? And I got my, I got a full CT scan on my heart and I got the scan on my aorta. Oh, okay. Whatever. And? 0% all over here, 0%. And then- I just, my cardiologist just sent me a picture of my blockage. It's uh, below 15% in this right. side, nothing over here. Okay. As long as it's solidified, you know. Well, um, so they put me on aggressive. Uh, by the way, this is probably the most boring <laughs> conversation for the average young dude. But one day you're going to be fascinated by this. They put me on aggressive statins. and uh, But they're, they're kind of, the statins are kind of fucking with my body. Well, why did they go aggressive? Even a small amount would probably stabilize that plaque and or yes. lower your L LDL. Your LDL was 400, right? Yeah, close. Yeah, 350. Uh, just the LDL. That's crazy. That's, that's high. Hi Familial hypoclostemia. How'd your dad die? Heart attack? Um, he grew at uh, collaterals. And so he had 100% blocked LAD by 82. They found it, but he just went about his day because he grew little little spidery bypasses. So my dad grew spidery bypasses. Jeez. Hey, Jesus wait a minute. Christ, is there a chance your dad's guy. my dad? <laughs> I got to call this is guy. Is there a chance, <laughs> any chance your dad's my dad? He, so that he had hundred percent blockage and the, it was, uh, those collaterals. Yeah. It was, keep, was keep it going. keeping him. Keep, keep going. Hey, yeah. what was your, what was your blockage in your, what was your heart shit? hundred percent blockage in the LAD. Okay. And you, same here. And well, I'm sitting with Dana Carvey, and he had the same thing. He got his stent in 90, 98. In 98. Yeah. When did you get your stent? God, he's that old, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I got it at I got 13. Mine, <laughs> I got mine in 2007. Okay. And then and, uh, this year. And then did yours re... What did yours do, Dana? Well, during that year, that LAD, when they put in a stent, and then they wrote a ruler, they put in another stent near the diagonal, and then a third stent, and they kept restenosing. 
resinosing, resinosing. Oh. Yeah. So then they said, let's just do a bypass and we'll just whip the mammary arteries around so they don't have to go out of your leg or wrist because yeah. they never block up. Yeah. So that's what they oh, did. But the yeah. guy missed. He's like, if you're trying to attach a hose to a tree trunk, he hit a branch. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> Motherfucker. Good damn Wait, it, how man. old were you when you got your first heart surgery, your first dent? I was 42. Holy shit, that's young. Fit. Yeah. How old were you, Dad? I was 60. You were 60? Nice. You yeah, beat me by 18 years, Dad. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. we're talking heart stuff. Hey, good luck. Talk livers, too. Yeah, we'll talk livers. All right. Love livers you. next. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But my... Uh, <laughs> My enzymes are, have always been in the in the green, yeah, and they were elevated just outside borderline there for the first time, and so my but they think it's because of the uh, because it's such a fucking long story. I went to this I went to this concierge doctor, and he was like super it. aggressive. He was like, "You need to be on uh, 40, 40 milligrams or twenty milligrams of atorvastatin." And my cardiologist is like, you don't need that. 10 milligrams is fine. Too much is going to we'll, fuck with We'll start out low and then yeah. check it. You know, and well, like, I wasn't 10. And then he just bumped me up. My cardiologist, I just went to him. And he's like, we're lowering your fucking dosage. You don't need to be on 20. This guy doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. He's like, I'm your cardiologist. He's just a concierge doctor. Fuck this guy. No, but so, he, he should know. Yeah. But yeah. So, yeah. so, so, so. So I go to, I go to a cardiologist every six months. Okay. Yeah. Cause it, it runs in our family. Everyone dies of strokes. Well, I'm glad you're on top of it. The, the thing is, the science exists now to essentially kind of arrest the disease. I mean, they can really take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> Did I scare you for a tenth of a second? I didn't hold it long enough. You could have been Dana. Dana. Uh, <clears throat> well, to me, you know, it was an excuse just to feel good and look good, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't really have any bad habits. The only time I'm a true, like a problem drinker is on an airplane. Oh, we talked about this a I little know, bit. And I don't fly that much. But if I was all the time, like I'm, we're taking off in heavy weather. If I was, that's how I really understand alcoholics. Like they're, they're at that level of anxiety. I'm, I'm doing that tonight on a, on a private to go to see Tom to do two episodes of two bears God, and you're incredible. And I, uh, we have, we're doing two episodes. So but does go, private help you or hurt you in terms of the fear spectrum? So it's interesting. The, so I have triggers that happen when I, when I like three hours before my flight, I start getting at hardcore anxiety. Yeah. And it's almost like I'm physically ill and I have blinders on. And I, and I'm, and I'm like, oh my God. I'm, I'm the same. Yeah. And I go, I need, I need a drink or something to just, just turn this into a fun thing somehow. And yeah. And so I've done a bunch of things to try to alleviate the anxiety of the airport. Right. And, and so, but still, so now I can get myself on a commercial flight. Fine. They don't, but it's the, before the plane on a private, it's right. not before the plane. Right. I don't have any anxiety before the plane. I don't have any anxiety when we get there, when we get on the plane and we start taking off and we start going up. Yeah. That's where my anxiety shows up. It, I don't get it on a commercial flight. I don't get it on takeoff. I get it up in the air a little bit. Sometimes I'm like, like on a long flight, okay. I'll, I'll get it. I do, once, once we're halfway through the flight, it's gone. Once I know that we're we're coming down, I have no anxiety. I might, yeah. It's all about the beginning of it for me. And, yeah. uh, I um, read a thing once, maybe this will help you. It's not that exotic, but if, when you get to two, it, say it's a million or 10 million to one <laughs> before, <laughs> after two minutes of flying, yeah. it goes to like 40 million to one. Really? So sometimes I'll just deep breathe and count to 120. I find myself not breathing. Like I find myself actually not breathing, Damn. like going like this, going like this. And then all of a sudden I'll go, am I not breathing? And then I'll just go and go, oh, wow, that, that's, I haven't been doing that in a while. Yeah. Uh, I have gotten bad. I've, and, I've, and I've been, I'm way better now, but there was a period of time hmm. where I always traveled with four bottles of Jack Daniels in my backpack. <laughs> and you could go through security with yeah, those? Yeah, they don't let you, they don't stop you. You can have eight. I've traveled with up to eight. And then I carry a water <laughs> bottle. When I go through security, I would get ice. I would then go to the bathroom, sit on the toilet, pour my Jack Daniels into my water bottle, close it. <laughs> if the, this is like at 6 a.m. if there wasn't a flight, if I didn't have a bar open, and then I'd have a, a double jack on the rocks before the flight, I would pour out of another one at takeoff and yeah. then pass <clears throat> out. <laughs> well, decadence in any form is is intrinsically funny. 
Yeah. So the idea of a guy with a double jack at 6 a.m. and everyone else getting on the plane, <laughs> ordering coffee, and just totally relaxed. Oh, with the their guy newspaper. that can order coffee, I do not understand that human being. Yes. Who's going to have a coffee, a fucking coffee. And my anxiety is through the roof on a coffee. I was doing Sober October one oh, year, yeah. and I wasn't drinking on flights, and I saw the guy get a coffee, and I go, <laughs> maybe I'll have a coffee. Next thing you know, I am shaking. No. Oh, not. No way. Well, two things. One is I've had some of my best times on airplanes. Me too. When I were on the Concorde, it was a little you scary. You flew the Concorde? I know. You flew the fucking Twice. Concorde? Shut the... Yeah. Oh, wait. Walk me through it. What's it okay. like? Fucking... Well, first of all, it's at New York Kennedy. So that was to promote Wayne's World. And I was like... I was naive then. And I go, well, I'm kind of burnt out. I think I'll go back to LA. They go, no, we'll, we'll get you on the Concorde. Oh, really? Well, still, I think I'll go back to LA. And they go, how many tickets you want? So I had like six, eight people with us on the Concorde. Shut up. Who did you bring? Um, my wife's niece. We had we had Dex with us. He was a little baby. We yeah. had a nanny because they were working. My wife and my mother-in-law. I can't remember, but it was a did lot. Did you feel big time? Like, have you, do, you ever, do you ever feel, do you ever have moments where you're like, where it's like a, you don't seem like a guy that flexes money or fancy things. I don't really want anything. I'm kind of sick that way yeah like you, know? you don't i heard you starting <laughs> to say something on bill maher and, they, and he cut you off something about you bought something nice for someone and then you went to buy the same thing for yourself and you couldn't do it i have it right now it, it's it's obscene i bought my nephew a guitar yeah that's right yeah a really nice guitar he, he had a band and you know i thought hey this is cool get him a really really nice guitar and then later on it was my birthday like a month later i go i'd like to buy a guitar and i realized i was having inertia i was like I can't buy a guitar. I can't afford a guitar. <laughs> Fucking sick, right? <laughs> but, you know, uh, but I've had great times on the planes and it's to your point, yes. Wait, go back to the Concorde. I would, but well, like, that like was part of the moment of like, when we got to you know, London and we're doing a press conference for Wayne's World. I'll tell you a moment, okay? okay yeah. So Wayne's World comes out. It's a bit of an abstraction to Mike and I. We're getting all these mail and all this shit. And we see it's number one, but we're still like, you know, we didn't get paid a lot, a lot for that. We're not rich or anything. Yeah. And then we're going to go to London and do the press conference or, you know, press for, you know. And so then we're going to show the movie to the press or public. So Mike now, and I. Now, do you know the, do you know the movie's hilarious or are you nervous? I couldn't watch it. I watched it in editing, but I couldn't watch it for like two years. Cause both Mike and I are pretty neurotic that way. Yeah. Like the first screening in New Jersey, both of us were like kind of disappointed. So we're at dinner and we're like, oh, I just, I thought my scenes, that was cut too short. This should have stayed longer. Oh we're just God. doing that. He's doing the same thing. And then the Paramount guy goes, it's got Ghostbusters numbers. Let's eat. So it had the top boxes and all that shit. Shut up. So you yeah. go to London, they do press con. You yeah, got and then we're, yeah, we're, we're, that's feeling, we're at the Dorchester, which is like a 10 star. Hello, talk me to Dave Foy. We had a private driver. Oh, yeah. I think the little guy should be in charge. Everything was Mary Poppins and British accents and everything. And then we go to show the movie. So they got Mike and I had our little suits on. We're kind of young. We're a little foppish in those days, both of us. And we're in this British sort of limo, cool thing. And we pull up. 5,000 kids are on this cyclone fence because they re released there or they're promoting there with posters screaming for us. So we came out like we were the Beatles. Like, ah. God. Those, and those are the OGs. Those are the kids that really get it. Like, those are the kids that got yeah. it first. I'm not an OG. I'm a guy who saw it because my friend said, have you seen Wayne's World? And then I yeah. watched it and I was like, oh, this is funny as fuck. But those kids are like tastemakers. They're the ones that get it first. Oh, yeah. Once they got hooked into it, it was, you know, I give Mike all the credit. I mean, he built the house and he let me rent a room, basically. <laughs> but I think the, the catchphrase, I think in the end of the day, the engine behind it <clears throat> was the two losers in town are the happiest guys in town. They're yeah. just so happy. And yeah. they're AMC Pacer. You know, it's snobs versus slobs. And Rob Lowe was the, the snobby guy. And we were like more blue collar, lives with his parents. And yet- a laughing our ass off and celebrating every moment, which is it's, what you do in your early twenties, right? It's, yeah, it's it's the funnest you've ever mm -hmm. had. Is when you have the like. Uh, I remember you said something about that in in an interview, and I thought my favorite time in college, and I, I had a really obviously it's been written about a really big time in college. I partied, I was written. Yeah. Up yeah. In, yeah. I remember you're, you're famous yeah, for, <laughs> for, for partying, but my yeah. favorite time in college was, Oh, there we are. Is that us? Wow. So there we are. And the fans are going crazy. God. 
And you were in suits. We had suits and we had foppish haircuts. We did go up there. We took, we said, you gave us the Beatles. We give you this humble movie. You know, it's like we were the head of the network. Tia Carrera. Tia Carrera. Ron Wood. And then we all. Oh my so we gosh. Felt like, so yeah, it's, it's, um, it, Neil Young has a line in one of his songs. It's, it, isn't it funny when you're finding out it's real? <laughs> and <laughs> it's like, I mean, you must have had it. Oh, and there's the Concord. So you take off and the British guy comes up. You'll love this. He goes, I go, well, I'll have a Bloody Mary, right? And he goes, he goes, ice and spice. <laughs> you know, so fucking British. I wanted to kiss him. Ice and spice. <laughs> On the way back, the guy goes, with all the bits and pieces. I'm like, this is too cool. <laughs> now there's no cockpit door. You can walk up. There's three guys up there. There's a little banister and you can just stand there with a beer and talk to the pilots. No. And you're seeing the curvature of the earth, the dark side of the earth. And when you sit in the chair, it's going miles per hour. So it's going six, 650, 670. And the pilot says, we, we, we shall now proceed Mach 1. You feel a little bit of inertia. So there was this little bit of a roar. And then we go, to, we're going faster than the speed of sound. Then it's climbing up 800, 900, 1100, all the way up to 14 something. And now we proceed to Mach 2. And then we're going like 1600. Shut the fuck We finally up. had a cocktail, a biscuit, and it's like, and now we'll be landing in Heathrow Airport. And this is a minute, gets your bags over. So it was, uh, yeah, two and two, uh, kind of loud. Two and two. So it's, it's, so it's kind of, it's not a not, great big plane. Yeah, know? it's a smaller yeah. plane, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. like, meaning compact in the interior. Yeah. It was more like a private. Yeah, more like a private. When I first went with, you know, so my fear of flying, so there was none of the game with the flight attendants and before the flight and whatever, Yeah, you know. Um, and it is kind of funny. If you order a Bl Bloody Mary, you're totally cool. But if you order a Heineken at 7 a.m., alcoholic. Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll have a beer at 7 a.m. I mean, a Bloody Mary. Well, that's a morning drink. I'll have five mimosas. He's not a big drinker. Can I have half a bud? Alcoholic. Row two. So then my first time I was on private, so like, nothing's stopping me oh. going to corporate dates. So I had a bucket of ice with 10 Heinekens in it. <laughs> and I had it between my, I had it between my feet and my ritual, my assistant, Julie May, she would laugh so hard, or, who, or my opening night going with me. I would take the Heineken, and it would be open, and I would just go like, I'd hold, I wouldn't drink it, and we're going down the runway. And then as the plane went up, my feet would go up like the Cowardly Lion in The Wizard of Oz, and it would just you know, go like that. That would, the inertia would bring them. So it became a ritual, but I calmed down. I don't want people to think, I couldn't look this good at this age. No, if I, if no I you look fucking on. great. Thank you. No, I have, we have, we had rituals on, so I never flew private. Uh, I mean, I'd done it on travel channel. And then the, when, when Tom moved to, mm -hmm. uh, to Austin and we had to do two bears yeah, uh, out of Austin, that is when it you was started the, really, the, that was the first time I started flying private mm -hmm. because uh, like, I, I won't fly private for gigs. I mean, I have, but I don't because it's just not the money. How are you going to get sense. around in Europe though? Uh, commercial. For, okay, so yeah. they're not so tightly spaced. They're, no. they're quick, they're, quick they're flights. every day, but it's an hour. So I have a rule now. My, I'm trying to make rules for myself. Um, I can't drink at airports, and I can't drink on flights that are under an hour. Anything over an hour, like six hours, I'm not going to fucking sit on a plane for six hours right. and just stare. Hour That's, is pretty amazing. An hour I can do. Yeah. An hour I can get through. And I'm also allowed to drink if there's turbulence. I'm not going to put myself through. I'm not going to punish myself. And are you flying and working the same night? Uh, yes. So, so then you really, so then I can't, but I've yeah. done it. I've done it where I've gotten fucking, I mean, the last run, the last run I did through Europe, uh, I was getting, I was with a comedian named Mark Norman. Do you know who he is? Don't think so. Perfect. The, uh, and <laughs> but he's a comedian. No, he's very funny and he's a partier, but he's like, a. he watched me drink at airports and he was like, mm. but we would party all night. We'd get, we'd sleep four hours. Yeah. We'd go to the airport. I'd drink at the airport, yeah. drink on the plane, go to the hotel room, pass out, wake up for the show. <laughs> and we just did it all through Europe. And it was absolute chaos. And I said to myself, I go, I can't do that. I just can't do that again. I'm, I'm, it, I'm not at my happiest and I want to really enjoy Europe. So I make rules. Well, you know, I hate a feeling if I'm tired or anything where the audience <clears throat> is better than me that night. Yeah. Like I'm not quite my peak, you know? Yeah. 
So for whatever, you know, so I usually fly in the day before. Oh, gigs, yeah. Because I'm not really on tour and doing a lot. Oh, I know? fly. Well, that's when I, when I got a tour I bus, it changed everything for me. Get a little workout the in. Tour bus well. changed everything for me. The flying yeah. in this will be difficult for the first four shows. Uh, Scandinavia and Germany will mm-hmm. be rough. And then Dublin, we have a day off before, <clears> so we'll fly in the day before. Um, and then it kind of lightens up. Like Europe, we're t- in, all through the UK, we're taking a, a tour bus. So, um, oh, okay. Yeah. So, but when oh, we had a rule when we flew private, we found a drink called a dirty girl and they were, and, <laughs> and then you have to have it. And they were <laughs> so enjoyable. It tasted like Kool-Aid and, uh-huh. uh, it was called an infusion. And our rule was, uh, dirty girls before takeoff. And then we, if we need cocktails, but we were just flying into Austin. I was always flying into Austin right. to do them and then flying in and flying out. And so and, and I would bring my whole crew with me, the, all the comics, because mm-hmm. they'd all like love to go do spots in Austin and fly private and right. stay in a hotel and fun. then fly out. Yeah, it yeah. was funny shit. And so tonight I'm flying, tonight I'm flying at eight o'clock. With? And with com- no, with my assistant. And then randomly, my wife's best friend, we were having dinner and I said, yeah, I got to fucking fly fucking into Austin. I'm coming back tomorrow at three in the afternoon. And I said, uh, mm. I said, it just fucking sucks. And then her, she goes, my daughter's always wanted to see that campus. And I was like, hop on the jet with me. Spend the day at Austin. Go see the school. And then fly back with us at three in the afternoon. So she's coming with us, my friend Sandy. Okay, my neuroses eventually became what private jet? Okay. Because I tell people, never be in a budget when you're vertical. Uh don't get a I've shitty done, I've private I've done the budget. Yeah. I've done the budget. Don't do a four-seater. <laughs> you can get on a plane built in 1968. Yeah. Or I see, what would Clinton or Obama fly? So because I was on before I, these old kind of Lear 55s. So we were doing, when we first started doing uh, the thing for, because Two Bears makes good money. So it, it was, it made sense for me to fly private, to fly right. out, especially, you know, it's part of our budget. And then, uh, but I would be, I would be like, get me the cheapest private jet you can get. Uh, 13 grand. Perfect. And we got on one that had, <laughs> yeah, that had one couch in the, in the back facing forward. So it was yeah. three, three people sat on one couch, fa- one seatbelt for all three of us. No bathroom unless it's a little door and you have to kind of nope, lean it like a no bucket bathroom. out of a drawer. No, it was yeah. no bathroom. It was yeah. a, it was a hole in the yeah. plane yeah. where we all pissed in a, in a thing and yeah. then poured it in the hole. And it was, we were laughing hysterically, <laughs> but when we got done, I was like, I will never do that again. No, no, no. <laughs> then you just go commercial. Yeah. If, if you can't get a nice one, does this seem like we're kind of bourgeois? first world idiots no, or something. No, no, no. I, well, I have a hard time with spending money. I end up becoming a little, like, I would argue stingy on the, on places that doesn't fucking matter. Well, I just, when I travel, I'll try to travel the best I can and stay in the best hotel. My wife is Irish Catholic, mother's from Dublin. You know, I say, oh, you don't need it. It's, all, it's just as much as you can. It's good yeah. enough, you know. You just don't, humility. She'll go coach and stay in a two star. Leanne, will, Leanne will fly coach. Yeah, Leanne doesn't. She'll say, "Oh, save the money." Yeah, and I'm I, that doesn't. I just think I I'll spend money experientially. I used to do the thing called the Lost Weekend with high school buddies and my brother. Yeah. We'd go to Vegas and I would just pay for everything. But it was seeing shows and we we'd go to Lake Mead. Everyone gets their own Wave Runner oh. when it was empty and really high. And we go to the islands and we'd have beer and you know just hang That's out. Fucking awesome. So that was okay. It was experiential. But like I like that. Mm-hmm. I like that. I don't have a problem spending money. Like for my birthday, I took all our friends, my parents, my sisters, mm-hmm. all down to Terranea, and we covered the bill. Because we wanted to make, we wanted everyone to go. We didn't want anyone to not go. Right. And it was for me. It was my present to myself was having everyone there. Yeah. I've yeah. done a lot of that with family, you yeah. know, hosting things and stuff like that. So, you know. Um, what about houses? Good. Did you, like, do you remember, what was the first house you bought in LA? I could tell you a lot about that one. It really? Was, uh, it was an El- Encino on Rancho Street off uh-huh. of White Oak. And it was 825000 for nice. like a 2500 that's Square great. foot Wait, ranch what year with was a this? pool. 89. Holy shit. What's that house? What do you think that house costs now? Uh, I believe it just went for four. But here's what we did. You're going to love this. Because we were just, we're having kids. We're just trying to figure out where do we land? Where do we raise them? We didn't thought, you know. So we, we, were, we, we put a half million into it. We mm-hmm. remodeled it, made it stunning. And then we just sold it and moved to Connecticut when I did the show in New York. Really? I shouldn't have sold it. So Never. It, my wife wanted it back. It was such a gem for LA. 
But now, I don't want to say who they are because maybe it's a location thing. But anyway, a, a rock star's kids leveraged a Malibu property and they live in it right now. Really? Yeah. Shut and up. I kind of feel like this, they're in my house. It's weird. Uh, yeah, because the first house, and to us, it was the Ritz. Our first house was uh, our first house was in Valley Village. Uh, we paid five hundred twenty thousand dollars for it in two thousand nine. Okay, and it was I think it was fourteen hundred square feet, Whoa. and it was it is my favorite house I've ever owned. I love that house. So much. my sister lives there now. Oh, okay. And, so you have it in we the still, house. I'll okay. never get rid of it. And yeah. I, and to yeah. the point, I remember yeah. Brian Regan came over one time and he said, uh, <laughs> and I was telling him, I said, I want to get, I want to buy the big house. I want to, one day I want the big house. And he goes, can I give you some uh, advice? And I said, yeah. And he goes, don't. I said, why? And he goes, this feels like a house a family lives in. He goes, it smells like a house a family lives in. He goes, it's got an energy. And he goes, once you get the big house, all the kids go to their rooms. But right now, and then yeah. as we walked into my house, my daughter, Isla goes, mom, Georgia kicked me in the vagina. And he looked at me and he goes, you're not going to get that in a big house. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I had went to Hollywood Big Shot's house in the 90s yeah. and everything was oversized. It was like a Monty Python movie. So you go in the living room, it's 10 times bigger than the living room should be. The hallway is a quarter mile. It seemed, I mean, we rented a place we called the Pink Palace in Malibu was like 10, 12,000 square feet. It just felt haunted and weird to me. Yeah. You go, you look down the hallway and it's like 200 feet. I mean, the bathtub was like half the size of this room. Everything was just gigantism. So yeah, I don't, I just don't need much. I don't know if it's a problem with me, but yeah. I'll tell you whose house is for sale or that it's sold is Pat Sajak. Pat Sajak just passed away, right? Pat Sajak died? Today? No, no. I think he died a while ago. Or is it? No. Who's that guy? Oh, that that was um, yeah. Oh, oh, who's Jeopardy? Alex Trebek. Alex Trebek. Alex yeah. Trebek passed yeah, away. Yeah, he passed away. Alex Trebek's that house. Was his house was yeah. fucking is getting torn down, and it is fucking awesome. At the base of Fryman Canyon, mm. no one lives there now, so I don't right. mind telling you where it is. At the base of Fryman Canyon, mm -hmm. it is fucking gorgeous. Oh, it there is it is. Huge. Yeah. It is, man. Seven million, and they're gonna tear it down. Mm. They're gonna fucking tear it down. It is so goddamn. Wow, pretty. that's got some deep pockets. Yeah. I do like the idea of a compound with multiple stru structures. Me you know, too. like a playroom and a recording room, place to paint because all old celebrities paint. You, you, <laughs> you kind of have to. Do you paint? Oh yeah, yeah. You, you sort of have to. Do you put them on? Do you put them on your website? Uh, not really. I'll just show you one so you can see it. But you know, it's just you just sort of have to. You will paint. You don't even know it, but you're going to be painting. What if it was old antebellum pictures of just blackface? <laughs> you're like, do you like it? <laughs> I do a lot of different styles, but this one. Mm -hmm. Talk amongst yourself. Yeah. Is this you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that's yeah, this is more. I'm a little Basquiat, a little abstract. That's like oh, wow. six feet tall. Oh, that's mm -hmm. great. See, it's it's just about a rich guy who got his ass kicked throughout his life. <laughs> it's a fat cat, but yeah. look at his face. He's got a demon face on the right. Yeah. He's got the posh when he was in his high thing on the left. In the center, he's just a wounded cat with one tooth left. And look, he's got the tie clip as a dog. He yeah. conquered, but he paid a price. <laughs> fat cat. So wait, you don't sell them? I don't. Oh, that's some of mine. Oh, that's early stuff. Yeah. That's... I don't, I don't, I don't. What do you I, do with them? I hang them up in my place. Yeah. Really? Yeah, hang them up. Blow them up, hang them up. Yep. Do you sell prints? I haven't tried to do any of that. I'm Aww. not a good businessman. I, I'm going to get- Oh, see, that's my problem. Yeah. So I had therapy. My therapist said, you need a hobby. And I started doing uh, leather working. Okay. And, and in the middle of doing it, I thought, I'll just sell these. Did someone teach you? How do you no, learn just, leather work? I just figured it out. Really? Yeah, I just was like, I think this is how it works. So you seem to be like uh, a self-actualized, curious human being. I'm very curious. I'm very, very yeah. curious. Because your I'm image not, could be if only, people only saw a part of something, or but you're yeah. you ever you have this whole other. Oh yeah, I think I'm not. I, I think well, I think I represent myself. I remember 
I had a pivotal moment in my life. I was really into baseball growing up and it was very competitive and took it very, very seriously. And when I went to college, mm -hmm. I was supposed to play in college and I just quit. I just quit. And I was like, I'm fucking done. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to party. Yeah. And we played, we signed up for intramurals. I think this kind of defined me and I didn't mean for it to, but we signed up for intramurals softball or no, it was uh, mm -hmm. our fraternity. Yeah. And everyone's like, uh, so everyone's like birds should play. And all the older guys only knew me as like a fuck off who smoked weed and partied and made mm -hmm. jokes. And, and all of a sudden this yeah, guy and comes then, out. And then they're like, of course I'm going to fuck. I'm not one to Burt play. And so they, I didn't tell anyone I could play. And they put me in right field. And I'm like, which I never took as an insult. Playing the outfield was part of the no, game. No, but let's, that's yeah, a little but they bit put me in right field yeah. as if that didn't matter. Right. And uh, the first fly ball that came, I like bucket catched it mm -hmm. and just kind of fucked around. Very competent. And then when I got up to bat, I hit a fucking dinger. And everyone's view was like, <laughs> it was almost like doing a magic trick. Yeah. It was like getting to be Rudy for real. And, but you knew you, you, you already had the deck, deck stacked. So I think when I got into comedy, I think I then lived my whole life that way. I'm very athletic and people always underestimate me. Uh, one, and Rogan's talked about it on his podcast, but like he, they bet that I couldn't run the LA marathon. And uh, they're like, no fucking way. And I was like, I can do it with no training. And they're like, there's no fucking <laughs> well, way. Well, that is pretty gutsy. <laughs> yeah, and I did. I ran the LA Marathon in five hours and 33 minutes. And I just was like, I can do this. Like, in my head, I just go. Knees okay? Yeah, yeah okay. everything was, I couldn't walk for like a week. But yeah, oh, it was really aggressive. I'm fascinated by real athletes. I just to, Real athletes? That know how to. Because you know the guy who's like ripped in the locker room? It's because that athlete knows intuitively how to use their whole body for every activity. Mm -hmm. So like for you, if you hit a ball that far, that means it's all lower body. And that's, you know, like golfers do, they yeah. play baseball and they're golfing, but that kind of athleticism is just a gift. I'm fascinated by, I'm fascinated by uh, like, th there's a couple guys like David Goggins and Cameron Haynes who are friends with Joe, who I'm fascinated by because they're motivational dudes who do athletics. They do ultra marathons mm -hmm. and lift weights, Yeah, but they don't, I, this I mean this as a compliment. It's not going to come out as a compliment, but they're not slick enough to try to be motivational guys. Right. They're like sometimes motivational guys. There's a creepiness to them oh, where it's yeah, like, or totally. they're they're too smart for the room. I mean this as a compliment. These guys aren't too smart for the room. Right. So they just tell you the facts of mm -hmm. what they do, and right. because of that, it connects with me. Yeah. Like I'm very punitive with myself. In in a sense of being hard on yourself. Wake up this morning. I. Uh, did a podcast with Steve Byrne and we did like probably 12 shots of, of uh, whiskey this morning, yesterday. Oh, yesterday. yesterday. Okay. I was thinking, yeah. I, no, 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 yeah, no, yeah. no. And so, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be healthier. So I woke up this morning and I said, uh, fuck it. We go to the gym and we, and it's almost like I, I, I can really focus my energy on working out when I know that I need to punish myself for yesterday. Yes, it's a process. Yeah, I mean, it's like flossing your teeth. You're never like, well, I did that. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's just, I wrote a booklet with a friend. It was called, You Better Get in Shape Because Science Won't Let You Die. <laughs> so in other words, you can be really old for a long time. Yeah, like if you let you go, wow. you're just shot at 60. You're an ancient guy, but they keep injecting into surgeries and you could, you know. So that's the reason to do it. And, yeah. you know. I had little chapters like, why do old people walk funny, you know? And what you need to work out is what you can't see in the mirror. Yeah. Because everyone's, everyone's pumping like this, but all the action is back there. Yeah. Your back, your glutes, hamstrings. Hamstrings. Ev everything. Hamstrings are the fucking heartbeat of your body. Like, your muscularity, getting off a toilet is the number one thing. You, hamstring and glutes. The glutes are the biggest muscle in your body. So yeah. my wife and women would always work their ass. And gay guys, I guess. Sorry. <laughs> we cut that out. <laughs> but my wife, we go to a gym that's predominantly gay. My wife yeah. watches yeah. guys on the butt blast for like a half hour. Yeah. Another set? Really? <laughs> Checking his... Nope, he's going again. So that ended up being incredibly what you should do. You know, and men, uh, they're just into what they can bench press and all that stuff. So, so we did, this month, we did five squats, five burpees, five push-ups starting December 1st. Whoa. And then we added five every day. Until we got to the end of the mm. month where we're doing 155 push-ups, 155 squats, and 155 burpees. Burpees are stupid in my opinion. I, they're really, I mean, they're really valuable. I think I, I know for a fact I'm, I can do more burpees than I've ever been able to do. Yeah. But for me, the game changer was squats. Yeah. Squatting 
was the thing adding these squats up was the thing where I was like, I'm like, I feel really good. Like was really it body good. weight squats? Body weight squats. Yeah. yeah. That's all I need. Tyson would do a thousand a day. Oh my God. And the thing is also is just what, what happens when you're younger, it's like you want to lift heavier weights and make it easier. Mm -hmm. When you get older, the idea is you lift lighter weights and make it harder. So people go, you're doing squats with that weight. You go, let me see you do one. Now try to do it harder. Because if people just bounce and count, bounce, you know, yeah. like push-ups, you know, do 10 push-ups, make it, make it last two minutes. Yeah. You know, well, God, dude, I didn't know, you know. So body squats, yeah, that is like a basic, incredible, it's great for warming up. It's credible for, like you said, because in the end of the day, as we see our parents, my parents went to the stars. Yeah. It's can you give yourself a shower? Can you reach? I know it sounds depressing. Dude, so that's it. That is walk? what it turns into. Yeah. Rogan's Ro Tom and I've said this, but Rogan's one that kind of put it in our brain is if you're not lifting weights at 50 and, and trying to keep your body strong, mm -hmm. you're fucked. Like, like, so that's why we're, I, I, it's, it's totally why all through Europe, I'm bringing my trainer just to right. kind of keep me honest about doing something active. Yeah. Like just doing even like the first day we're in Oslo, we're going to a fjord and we're doing mm -hmm. a sauna polar plunge. Yeah. But I love that shit. Uh, that feels great. I yeah. love that. Yeah. Do you ever sauna? In the hot sauna and then you oh. go to the cold plunge. I haven't in a while, but it's my that, favorite that's fucking awesome. thing. It's my yeah. favorite. Well, the thing is, unless you have some help, it's hard to build muscle after 60. Yeah. You know, I mean, you need but, testosterone. Mm -hmm. I'm actually, when I fly to uh, secret time, but when I fly to, uh, Austin tomorrow, mm -hmm. I'm meeting with uh, a guy that, that does testosterone because it, I mean, apparently if they just get you to your normal levels, you mm -hmm. just, you lose weight. Like I can't lose weight. I'm trying desperately. Does, do you know what your level is? Uh, 256. And I think it starts at 254. Like it's really That's like tragically low. Kind of low. I'll, yeah. so I'll tell you my exact <laughs> testosterone level because I just got it tested from my, uh, it's funny. Do you get scared going to the doctor? Um, more fascinated, you know. Really? No. I had a scare a while back. They thought I had salivary gland cancer for like a month. And then they did the microsurgery and they go, no, it's just more salivary glands. Because all the, you know, all the tests came back. Oh, that's probably so. Really? I just get really interested. But I try not to go down a, a rabbit hole online where it's going to terrify me. I try to pick my sights, but the other thing to look for is, you know, what's your estrogen? <laughs> my, my, my testosterone is 284 okay. and it should be anywhere in the range of 250 to 1,100. Mm -hmm. Here's my, um, I'm about to show you my LDL panel. <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> my no LDL was 97. That's good. Under yeah. 100 is good. Under 100 is good. Mm -hmm. My LDL is 97. But my testosterone's in the shitter. I mean, look at that. <laughs> so I would like yeah. to get it to like 500 mm -hmm. because then they say it, that like I have a fatty liver from just being a fat yeah. piece of shit. Yeah. <laughs> and so <laughs> who doesn't have a fatty I liver? I think, well, that's what they say. They say everyone, they're like, it's the number one thing that they see when they go into like, hospitals and they start mm -hmm. taking blood work it's the number one thing that shows up fatty liver. and it, my dad mm -hmm. had one and uh and it's mostly from fucking carbs and sugars yeah so but by the way i could talk to you i could talk to you for fucking ever i love all this stuff I do, i'm fascinated by it but if you ever God. come back we're doing we're building a new podcast studio down the street and uh jesus you guys have christ's sakes dennis miller okay you got a little kingdom here all right <laughs> Kind of a multi-million dollar outfit for two cats and a bear or something like that. Okay. You got to go down to the one in Austin. You should see Tom set up. He showed it to us on the Zoom. I mean, he's got these magic light 8K cameras, so it's like filmic Yeah. there, you know. And then he says he got the mics because he knows the FM DJs had those big silver mics. So yeah. You guys are a team, man. Well, you guys are... He's, he's the, like, I would say he's a lot like, we, I think me and you talked about this. He's a lot like Mike Myers and mm -hmm. I'm a lot like you. Like he, he's definitely. He's kind of a part scientist artist. He really likes, well, I would say he's more, Tom is a definite businessman. Mm -hmm. Like he looks at things from a business perspective first and foremost. Good for him. And so I do not, I look at it from, does it make me giggle? Passion. Is it fun? Yeah. Like even like even when he moved to Austin, I was like, "Yeah, I'll, I'll fly." He was, he was very concerned about the business model, 
So he's like, you know, I want to grow this brand and this and that. And I was like, I was like, yeah, I have fun doing the podcast. Right. And then when we decided that we do some here and some there and, and have guest bears, that made it a lot easier. Cause I was like, I don't have to travel every fucking month for four days. Well, this is still very new and God, wouldn't you, I mean, for me, I would have loved it if like Carson had a podcast after he retired telling <laughs> stories and, and I wouldn't be like, I'd rather have Neil Young come out and talk about his songs rather than play them at this point. Yeah. You know, so it's fun to see, you know, I didn't rotate through all my voices. I, I could take requests, but <laughs> you know, I, I don't well, really. Well, Carson, did, did Carson mm -hmm. didn't like you doing him? Finally, when there was one where he, they, he, they, it was written like his little senile. I didn't write that one. And I was a little suspicious about it, but that kind of burned him. Yeah. So really? I was blacklisted. But you did, but you did Carson back in the day. You did Carson. While Carson was still on. Well, yeah. I did his show. Yeah. I yeah. did it six times. And I was always first guest out. I was on his best of shows. We were really uh, what was he good like? friends. Um, I mean, um, he was like, he was the one thing my, I, I didn't realize what anxiety was when I was a kid. And the one thing that would calm me down was watching Carson and Leno. So Carson yeah. and Leno for me, I've always said this. There are so many people that define your, your personality comics. Yeah. Like when you watch them as your kid, they be, you, you, you become them. Like that becomes who you are, whether it's like Chevy Chase or Bill Murray or Farley or you mm -hmm. or Mike Myers, what you like, like, uh, or, but Carson and Leno for or Carson and Letterman for me, were two people I watched every night when I was mm -hmm. 10 years old wow. when we moved into our new house and I didn't I, I didn't realize but I had sleep anxiety and mm -hmm. I would just stay up and watch them and then hopefully try to yeah. fall asleep at some point or literally the American flag would show up on the television. Do you remember that? Oh yeah. Yeah. It doesn't happen anymore. I know. Yeah. I miss those days. But what was Carson <clears throat> like? Yep, there we are. <laughs> was he cool? Um I would say, you know, it was he was, uh, when he was out there, he had an earnestness, which is something I found very attractive in my wife, just earnestness. Yeah. So when Johnny was out there, he was like, he could really relate to everybody. He set you up. So I understand you have that. And he had a great laugh. Yeah. He was there for you. It was analog television. So it was not HD. Yeah. So when I go out the first time I sit next to him, I'm like, holy fuck. The makeup is like this thick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot of cigarettes in that skin, a lot of Coke. <laughs> And a lot of sun. And it's like, whoa. And little wispy gray hair. He's like 62. But uh, he was very supportive and stuff backstage. He was really shy. And I don't know if I've said that on Bill Maher, but I knew someone who was his girlfriend in, when he was in his mid-50s. And really? you know, Yeah, he wasn't high on stage, but he did a lot of coke and drank a lot, but was yeah. very, you know. Toward the end, Johnny did 100 episodes a year. Leno did 80. With the slog that these guys go through now, yeah. and when I talk to the talk show host that I know, it's like, well, maybe one more year, fuck it. You know? <laughs> but Johnny was like, I'm, I'm taking the next two weeks off, and uh, Ed, you'll be here with Jay Leno, and uh, we'll see you next time. You know, and he, it would, he had Joan Rivers, he'd take Fridays off. So I don't know about this slog of 30 years, but um, really likable. I think um, he was kind of like, because I was doing voices, he goes, I I'm working on my uh, George Bush too. You know, he wanted to be a comedian, wanted to be one of the boys. Yeah. And um, I think he was a really complex guy. Really? Really complex. Yeah. I heard this. I mean, had a, so it had an edge to him. Really? Like, yeah. <laughs> we all do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but I, I mean, he seemed, I remember hearing the story about the guy, his son killed himself, right? Uh, probably. It was one yeah. of those things. He had three sons and then he became Johnny Carson and left and i guess you would give them 35,000 a year uh at christmas time that's all you get 35,000 and sayonara you know <laughs> so you can make it on your own but i'll say this as someone who loves voices johnny has the voice of the last 30 40 years <clears throat> what do you mean well you know jay jane was thought like but he was down here like this he was oh, that was just a comic gear when you yeah. go high yeah tiony it just it was basically down here and was good but it was but johnny um Nobody said this, you know, that kind of is sort of deep and had a little, it just, it just uh, seduced you. A gentleman joins us, comes here uh, from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. I understand he's got some success. I mean, probably the most nervous I've ever been was behind that curtain. I'd been on SNL for a few months behind that curtain. I'd never been out there and hearing him talk about me. So I'm in the dark behind the curtain. Gentleman joins us. Uh, he's had some success with a character called the Church Lady on Saturday Night Live. Please welcome, please welcome Dana Carvey. You know, it's just like, 
whoa, it's me coming out, you know, <gasps> the church lady. Well, that's all, all my characters are passive aggressive because I, that's probably was me in a nutshell, the nice guy with a lot of anger from yeah. all those whippings. Well, well, well. We like to talk about naughty things. You know, it's all that. <laughs> the it's church just lady was such. I was in fifth grade when the Ten. church lady came yeah. out. I was in fifth grade. Mm -hmm. And uh, my buddy Brian Callahan would did the perfect impression. I mean, that was like, you know, that's when you, if you saw something funny on TV, one guy did it at school and then that was his thing and he yeah. did it. And Brian Callahan murdered the church. I fucking forgot about the goddamn church lady. Oh uh, my God. And that was right when we moved. So with that, and when, that was when I was 10, I'm guessing mm -hmm. we moved yeah. to, we were in the Bible belt, but we moved to the North part of Florida, Tampa, where it was more redneck oh, yeah, and more, yeah. more yeah. Christian. Yeah. And, and that was when Jerry Falwell, oh. Jim Baker, all that was going on. All this kismet happened. It was just part of my stand up. I'd never done it in a dress. So suddenly, okay, we'll try it. No one thought it would work because there's no real jokes. Yeah. And then, you know, I had Phil Hartman and Jan Hooks coming on scoring or Sean Penn be try to beat me up or, and then there were all these religious scandals. And so it came together where it was really, really useful for the show. That was the most recent one. I think him doing Trump. Is that, is That's that a real Daryl Hunt? Daryl Hammond. Hammond. Yeah. He could look more like Trump than anybody else. He's fucking amazing. Yeah, he's, he's his. Really some good. of his voices are just startling. God, the church lady, motherfucker. There she is. How many you've you've had probably more? Do you think you've had more successful characters? Not just like like sp sp like Farley would just show up. Like Farley had Farley was the character. Yeah, basically. Farley was the. It was he, Farley, he, and that's doing what it. was that's brilliant. I mean, yeah. that's a singularity. For me, my tent poles for characters were church lady Hans and Franz, and then Wayne and Garth. So one with Kevin. Hans and Franz were so funny. And then the, because of the impressions, they almost overshadowed the characters, but they're but the, what people would remember for me is now probably Ross just, Perot. Didn't you do Ross Perot? Can I finish one time? <laughs> now, you say it's two bears in one cave. Bears normally have their own cave. Now, I, I understand it's kind of funny. I understand. But if you want ratings, you want to go get two bears and two cakes. That's the only thing. Can I finish one time? Are you going to talk over me? It's very simple. So he just came on the scene and that was it. It was just like a perfect character that came out. It was, it was like Sarah Palin for, for Tina. Yeah. Like a funny, you didn't have to exaggerate or anything. Just I read do a it. Book, I read a book about Ross Perot. He, uh, See, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. You know? <laughs> he, uh, Everything we talk about, you've read about no, it or studied it. No, no. Well, he is, I think it was called Operation Hotfoot. He had a bunch of his employees <laughs> Uh, get kidnapped by uh, the, oh, yeah. in the Iranian yeah. terrorists. And he fucking put together, what is it? Yes. Wing, wings of the Evil, of the Eagle? It was, I think it was called maybe Operation Well, he Eagle's did a Claw. whole operation to rescue them. And yeah. last year, there's a high value writer, this brilliant writer wrote this miniseries, I think for Ross Perot, the story of Ross Perot, yeah. and wants me to play Ross Perot. You know, I didn't have the time it? last year. I could revisit it because it. Who's ever heard of him? But you know, he's just a funny, interesting, fascinating character. You know. God, I remember when he showed up on the scene. Yeah, there he is. But he rescued people. He I was think it was quite called a, Operation Eagle Claw or Operation yeah. Hotfoot. You try to use as little force as possible, and this is how you go in in the night. Careful that you don't get caught. See, I have to warm up. It's like starting a car. I what's the, to what's the what's your big your white whale of of impressions that you could never really get but you love? Oh golly, um, I've I've never really worked on John Malkovich, but I think there's a really good one there. Oh yeah, yeah. Can't you tell that he's lying? It's hard because <laughs> it goes into Travolta very easily. That's a delicate one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just kind of lazy about it. <laughs> Like if you gave me three now and I said, okay, I'll come back a year later. If I work on them, if I hear I can find an angle. Um, I never really have worked on uh, Biden that much. I, you know, just, I, yeah. I do it. What's funny. I couldn't, if you told me to do an impression of Biden, I go, I don't know what he sounds like. But then when you hear someone do it, you go, that's it. Yeah. Like I, I, like I heard someone did Vince Vaughn to me the other day. Oh, and, and they do that kind of shit. And, and it's I go, like, I go, wow, damn, how great. do they do that? That's great. Yeah, there's young people online that do some amazing. But Biden was just, you know, kind of, kind of, initially, my father lost his job. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's, a, it's no, a, oh. no, no joke. 
No joke. No one thinks it's a joke. Yeah. I'm getting around here. Come on, like the Fowling Flaws is proclamated in the Declaration of Impedance. <laughs> the people, all men are secreted equally. So, excuse me, secreted, pardon me, secret, pirate, pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> I love you guys. That's my favorite part of the podcast, that laugh, because that, the abstraction with Biden is he always finds his way to Pirates of the Caribbean. Some reason it's perfect. So the people, you know, if people say, there's no inflation. If you, we know how to stop inflation, paper, 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 parts of Caribbean. <laughs> he just always finds his way there. So that's my Biden oh. hook. The fact that you guys oh. found that funny, that's my real sense of humor. Dude. The you, inexplicability. You are that. the fucking best. There was, just for the fans. I never was, told you about the Coors people. It was two thirds. Yeah, let's finish with that. The so, Nazi Coors. So the, so the, so the, uh, apparently one of the Coors brothers, so the Adolf starts it. The second Adolf gets kidnapped. Mm -hmm. And they find him in a riverbed. Right. Right. Yeah. He's got some sons. Yeah. And the sons have all grown up with privilege and they don't, and, and they're also very secluded. Now the, the cores, what they ended up doing is they ended up, their hiring practices were so illegal. They'd force people to take lie detectors and go, are you a homosexual? <laughs> in the thirties? <laughs> no, in the fucking seventies. In the seventies? Yeah, in the seventies. You're just working yeah. at a brewery? <laughs> Do you know what the name of the brown eagle is? No! <laughs> Stop! I don't want to work. So, how so do you pour a proper beer once again? <laughs> ah, tilt the glass. Ah! Sorry. That's kind of what it was. You've listened then, to us. And then, and then, the, and then this was the big one. Their big cross to bear was he goes to. They had a, They didn't hire any black people or Latino people. They for like a long time they didn't hire any. It was the seventies. Sorry, so, folks. So then he goes to a meeting of black and Latino people, and he goes, you know. <laughs> My family's a lot like you guys. <laughs> you guys should be thankful that you were slaves. He said that? He said that the, and I'm just like, and you, and by the way, the guy that said it is being interviewed. And he was like, I mean, I was trying to connect with them. <laughs> just fucking. And so, and oh, so, and they had a real a big backlash. <laughs> And then he's then they started and they're in Colorado where it's like the most yeah. liberal place. So now they've they've fixed it and they're trying. They do a bunch of these proactive programs. But mm -hmm. I love fucking Coors Light. Coors Light was like the biggest beer on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. it wasn't you couldn't sell it uh, on the other side of the country, and they were yeah. number number four in the in the country, and they only sold it to the West Coast. And so they were really like hard to get. And it was like it was a. Uh, I think it was one of the presidents, Gerald Ford, it was his favorite beer. Like, like everyone loved this beer. Smoking the Bandit's based on Coors. Really? Yeah, wow. Smoking the Bandit, the whole mm -hmm. idea is he wants Coors. So he has Smokey get him two cases of Coors, put it in the back of his car, and drive it to Georgia because you couldn't get it in Georgia. 4.2. Yeah. I mean, lager beers, um, you know, there's not a lot going on there, but you never get in trouble. Well, it's the ice cold. It's the ice cold it has uh, to be the mountains. Ice cold the water coming off of right. the streams that that was the selling How much point. do you think between Bud Light, Coors Light, Miller Light, how much is marketing or bald face taste a more a superior product? Well, I, you know, it's so interesting. I had a joke about this in my special. Uh, all of the beers are, mm -hmm. are tethered to a soda. Like this looks like a Diet Coke. Right. Like it's can. the same, yeah. almost the same branding. Mm -hmm. And so the same with Budweiser looks a lot like Pepsi. And you start going through. And mm -hmm. I, th I thought that, because I, I, one time I, I was a joke. I had my special, but I grabbed a couple Diet Cokes to take to right. school. And I had a te parent teachers meeting with my, about my daughter's dyslexia. And I cracked mm -hmm. my Diet Coke and I take a sip and realize I have a Coors Light. <laughs> in a meeting i'm drinking a course right. light and i was and i just murdered it i fucking murdered it and prayed that the other one in my pocket was a course light too and then i killed both of them i said that gentleman that's like a finger in your ass at an orgy you got a game time decision do you pull away from it or do you push back into it <laughs> so so uh well this is rocky mountain high budweiser yeah. is america yeah budweiser's well yeah they're all german they're all german at yeah. the core but it's, uh, I watched the whole documentary on this and it's shot before they were putting them in letterbox. Mm -hmm. So you can, and like, it's all a little grainy and like the old people are still alive. Ah, oh, kind of cool. I have yeah. confirmation with Paul Newman's beer consumption. What? Paul Newman. He's got a beer? You know, he was a, he was a famous Budweiser yeah. drinker. Oh, was he? 
So I know somebody was his assistant on Cool Hand Luke. So when I ran into some stuntmen at the gym, old stunt guys, <clears throat> yeah. I said, who's the, tough, who's the toughest guy in Hollywood? You know, I think John Wayne or Robert Mitchum. They go, oh, it's Newman. Uh, Newman by far the toughest. Really? So Newman on Cool Hand Luke. I assume you guys have seen that yeah, movie. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of, of course. All fuck, time. Yeah. So he would do a case a day of throughout the day filming a bud. He uh, he wouldn't finish every beer, but it'd be like a case. And then he would go, he'd have ice cubes in the tub and a straw. So he'd do that. And then he would go in the saw, you know, the hot box from the movie. Yeah. And they could not believe how long, no one could stay in the hot box as long as Newman. And this was not during the movie. Yeah, look, he was just ripped because he kind of didn't eat. He would just graze popcorn and walk, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Later on, he was a six pack a day when he's in his seventies, but 24 a day. Holy He's shit. the coolest. The reason I love that guy, put him on a pedestal is because he, they say, oh, Newman's own, you've raised a lot of money for charity. Instead, you know, the modern person would be like, well, you know, he just went, I, I would have kept the money if I'd known it was going to be that successful. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, yeah, I, yeah. just love someone who's like, no, don't put me on a pedestal. And when people would ask him, why are you successful? How did you get successful? He goes, I can tell you anything, but you know the reason? Luck. So, I mean- I two things said that yeah. I, I used to have a thing about luck. Yeah. I used to sit and say it's, it, it so much has to do with luck. Yes. That like, I'm <laughs> luckier than I am talented. I, I'm luckier than I am hardworking. I'm luckier. I'm just lucky. I'm, I met, I mean, obviously it, it, this is a perfect example. I'll, I'll use Tom as my example of success. Without Tom, I don't, I'm not really certain where I'd be because I got so much advice from him when I was lost in the business where mm -hmm. he had succeeded. But if you want to talk about luck, Tom sold his first special, I think disgraceful or 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 mostly stories yeah. to Netflix yeah. when they become the biggest streaming platform right. and Tom blows up. Yes. So now randomly my friend is becoming quickly the most successful comedian in the world right. and I happen to be his friend and I can pick right. his brain about what to do. And, and, and he introduced me to Rogan. I mean, so much luck is involved as opposed to like, I've seen some really talented people, comics where you go, I can't, I can't catch a break, you know? Well, you know, um, you're, you, you're super likable <laughs> Oh, well, thank you. and fun to hang out with. You're a comedian who laughs fucking yeah. crazy <laughs> and you're really sneakily very extremely bright <laughs> thank, thank you <laughs> i don't wear it on your sleeve but you know you're well read and you're very curious so people want to hang out with you yeah. but to your point i mean for me because i had no sense i could be a star even after snl yeah but even before i did all these shitty shows and i just thought and i was 31 and i'd auditioned twice and i didn't get snl wasn't going to get snl and then the, the show sucked in 85 and they were recasting again. My manager knew Bernie Brillstein. It was Lorne Michaels' manager. And I'd just gotten with that manager, Brad Gray. Oh, Brad so Gray is a legend. All this stuff kind of came together. He gave me confidence. He saw me in the club. He goes, you should be on Santa Live. You know, really? Because my previous manager's like, ah, it's not happening, kid. Because yeah. the Disney face and my insecurity going on in an 815 slot at the improv, I would just suck. I would bomb. So for, for the, it to recast, me to freakily get on because Rosie O'Donnell let me lean on on a mic, so I did 40 minutes. Yeah. Freakily get on the show, can't believe it, hang out with Lorne Michaels. The very first show, I never I never done sketch comedy. I'm in four things. I'm in the cold opening. I do Church Lady. I do Chop and Broccoli. <laughs> Chop and Broccoli. So that is when I went back in the dressing room and I kind of broke down a little bit, you know. Because yeah. I was really frustrated. It was a, it was a 10 years because I'd been in Rockefeller Center in 80 uh, doing one of the boys with Mickey Rooney and Nathan Lane thinking, ah, oh, I could get up there. So to your point, a lot of things had to happen. Yeah. After I started kicking ass in the show, people go, you're a natural. This is always going to happen. No, 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 no. <laughs> I had to get confident, which I still got, you know, and I had to get that luck. Yeah. So the, you just have to have a lot of humility when you have success in a free market society. Because no one can just will it, you know. Yeah. You I, have I, to get lucky. I used to take it. I, I, I regret saying it now, but I'll say it again. But I remember when I would watch Kevin Hart, who I knew. Yeah. I, I knew him at the clubs, and I, I still know Kevin. Sweetest guy in the world. The greatest guy in the, greatest mm -hmm. guy in the world. Um, I remember he would do these Instagram videos about how he's the hardest working comic in the business. That's why he's successful. And I kept wanting him to address his luck. Because the luck is so 
integral. And then someone pulled me aside. And it was an agent. He goes, you know, who Kevin's break was. And I went, what? And he goes, Cat Williams packed a gun in his bag to go to on to shoot a movie with Matthew McConaughey. And I was like, what? He's like, you never heard this story? And those stories for me are so much more fascinating. Mm-hmm. I was like, what? He goes, he did Soul Plane and Soul Plane bombed. And so he was like, he had to go right. back to the end of the line again. That's okay. when the move, they were doing movies yeah, like that. Yeah, and then he goes back. Oh, he's box office poison. He goes, yeah. uh, <clears throat> Cat William goes to do uh, Fool's Gold with Matthew McConaughey and, and uh, Goldie Hawn's daughter, Kate Hudson. Yeah. And he packs a gun in his bag and he gets pulled out of his line and he gets arrested. And he can't do the movie now. So they go to Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle's in South Africa. He just left the oh, Chappelle he show. Left. He's gone. Yeah, yeah. Well, shit. We need someone small and black. <laughs> <laughs> Who oh, do we get? Kevin Hart. And I heard that. And I went, I, first of all, I didn't know if it was true. Because you hear from an agent. Yeah. But I go, I would love those stories of luck. I, I talked about it with Tom about, because Rogan was very integral in both our careers of sharing his fan base with us, making a, like being generous, being that's, like, he's our, car, about, our Carson. That's great about Joe. Yeah. And, yeah. and, but I remember saying to Tom, do you ever think about that? And Tom goes all the time. He goes, I was supposed to go to dinner with Charlie Murphy that night. And I was, and Charlie Murphy was dragging his feet and he just wasn't moving. And I was like, and he goes, and I almost sat in the car and waited for him, but I thought it would be rude. So I waited at the venue right. and Joe came up to me and said, Hey man, you're funny. You should go on the road with me. And he goes, if Charlie Murphy had been on time, I never would have talked to Joe and I never would have this relationship with Joe. Jesus. It's like the crazy shit like that. That for me is more interesting in this business sometimes than the, now look, I have to say this, Kevin Hart. I know how hard, hard work is. Mm -hmm. That guy has nine businesses. I can't imagine the clip that he works at. I can't even wrap my head around and I can't disqualify his hard work. His hard work is where he is today. Well, the only thing you can kind of control is a standup, which I always tell young standups is just get better at standup. Yeah. You know, be ready. And that's just a matter of listening to your act. And, you know, standups, sometimes they they have mediocre bits that aren't working. They keep doing them without yeah. changing them. You're like, you got to either step that up or throw it out. So you can only be ready. But then, you know, if you want to go really abstract with it, you know, I used to do a bit about a ventriloquist in Vegas can make 20 million a year. Yeah. His talent is talking without moving his lips. Now, that guy in 12th century Great Britain, what we, what can you do to help the king? Next, please. What can you do? Do you have any skills, anything you can do? Are you a god or you can throw a hatchet or anything? No, sir, I don't. Well, what? why am I talking to you? What can you do for the king? Well, sir, so I can talk without moving my lips. <laughs> talk without moving your lips. So that's impossible. The larynx has to form the words. The lips are impossible. Show me this sorcerer's trick. Well, I talk like this. And then I talk like this. Oh, that's fantastic. You're a star. I'll give you a million dollars. But the point is, is like, I was born in 1955. Yeah. I was white. I was in America. I had yeah. a shot. Yeah. You know, the technology begats now the 2.0 of people making millions of dollars through digital commerce. Either yeah. YouTube, a guy opens a jar of pickles, give him a million dollars. Fans, <laughs> only fans. Charlie Seen's daughter, she's probably making 500000 a month, not even being naked, not yeah. doing porn, just squatting in her panties in, in the snow. Yeah. And <laughs> can I get my half million fucking dollars now? So you could say long ago, well, it's because it's 2023. And all these applications, like in the Gilded Age in 1880, suddenly there's these billionaires because we had all this automation and well, I'm going to control the trains and the oil. And so we were born at a time and then you came up like Sid Caesar would have had a podcast because variety players usually after their variety run, where do they go? You know, like yeah. they don't really keep going, but now they'd have these podcasts. Oh so, yeah. So I that's got, part of it. I got so lucky. I got so lucky too. in that I was just, I felt young enough to still welcome in technology. Yeah. There was a lot of guys my age that didn't welcome in technology. Right. Didn't want to have a podcast. Thought that was stupid. Didn't want, didn't want to be vulnerable <laughs> enough. Yeah. St- and, stupid. That's stupid. And, and, and I just got lucky enough to like have one, let it suck. And then, and just be, and, and enjoy it. I enjoy podcasts. Well, I, there is one yeah. other element that you can control. One is just work on your craft, get whatever your skill set is, get that as high as you possibly can. And the other thing is just don't quit. You, you can, you can choose not to quit. Yeah. And that's important too. That's a Winston Churchill quote. Is choosing it? Yeah. Something about, oh. the I, I forget what it is. My mom sent it to me on a bookmark when I was a kid, when I was first moved to New York and I remember reading it and it was something I, I can't find it. I've looked for it everywhere. I can't find the bit, but it was, is the idea that 
the only people that fail are the people that yeah. quit some of that. And I remember looking at a comedian named Dimitri Martin saying, oh, we, no, yeah. we had just started, we'd started yeah. together on the same day. And I remember saying, I remember he was so talented. He still is so really fucking bright. talented. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. That I thought if I don't quit, I can get a job with him. Like yeah. I'll just, just, if don't I just quit. stay friends with him. Yeah. And then one day, He'll be like, "Hey man, I need I need a fat shirtless guy right. or whatever," and then I'll I'll have jobs if I'm just don't yeah. quit and you and people will give you jobs. Yeah, they used to ask Walt Disney, "How are you doing?" He goes, "I failed twenty nine times. All he did was count his failures." He, they were like arrows in his quiver. Yeah. Wow, I got my ass kicked and I'm still here. So for me, at this continuum where I'm at now in my sixties, late sixties, I'm like. This is just cool. I'm just still doing it. But yeah. I look at Martin Short and Steve Martin. I go, I guess you can just keep going. You stay in shape. Yeah, fuck yeah. There he is. Never. I'd watch. I'd watch. I'd watch. Never give I'd, up on something you can do to a day without thinking about. He's one of my favorite. He's one of my favorite. Winston Churchill's one of my favorite. Mickey Mantle's one of my favorite. And I hate to say this. Now Paul Newman is one of my favorite. I'm now going to become a huge Paul Newman fan. Oh, yeah. I fucking love that. You a case a day. Fuck yeah. Budweiser. If you want to have, read the Alone Years, there's big volumes on him, but the Alone Years, A Day in the Life of Winston Churchill. I think that's what it's called. <laughs> a Day in the Life of Winston Churchill in the 1930s was it the first chapter. <laughs> I thought so. So I celebrate, <laughs> I celebrate Winston Churchill Day uh, every year. And maybe that was the subtitle. You know, but anyway, that was him. But he, his find day, that will you find that book? The I lonely read years, that. maybe that's it. The lonely years, yeah. But his day in the life where they'd get him out and give him champagne and put him in the tub and put him back in bed, you know, the whole oh, drill. Yeah. So, and so he, in really, on the day he died, January I think twenty fifth, I celebrate Winston Churchill Day. Will you pull up a picture, please? So this is my. And Tom and I just did this last episode. I'd be curious to hear your breakdown. But well, so, I have one theory. But what? you don't have to interject it yet. Well, okay. So so this is, I do a Winston Churchill <laughs> day every year. So, <laughs> so I have Winston Churchill's breakfast, a oh, scotch, wow. this coffee, is awesome. eggs, bacon, a cigar, toast, jam, butter. Uh, I have his whole breakfast. Mm -hmm. I have my cigar and, uh, yeah. and coffee and scotch in bed. I drink it in bed. Wow. And then uh See, that's like a Wayne's World move. That's ritualizing life. Yeah. You know, like a And then kid. I do it throughout the day. At lunch I have champagne and yeah. then at night Take a 2-hour nap. Yeah, take a 2-hour nap. And then you have more and champagne and scotch. It was the funnest. Whiskey. This is the Winston oh, Churchill. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay, the first whiskey first. Nine <laughs> yeah. This is cigar, incredible. whiskey optional walk around the neighborhood. I chose to get on the treadmill. I got <sighs> on the treadmill. Uh, lunch and I had lunch. I had chicken and champagne, another whiskey. I had, I did not have a shot of cognac. So I don't like cognac, but I did have another whiskey. I took a nap and at dinner, my wife and I went out to dinner and I had dinner wow, champagne that's awesome. and I got back. I had a whiskey and a second cigar that evening. And it was the funnest fucking day. It was fun to take my day and go, this is what it'll be. I'm, I'm following this rule. So then Tom and I saw Hunter wow. S Thompson's day. Have you ever seen Hunter S Thompson's day? No, I'm okay, sure. So this one's good. More. Type in Hunter S Thompson's day and then I'll put it to you. Because, okay. Okay. Because Tom and I picked, our day after right which like, one would you do well we well hunter s thompson's day is fucking next level rise 3 p.m 305 shivas with the morning paper in a dunhill cocaine for 345 oh, okay. so he's another yeah. glass of shivas 350 first cup of coffee in a dunhill 405 415 cocaine 416 <laughs> orange juice oh in my a dunhill. god the human body 430 cocaine wow. 454 cocaine 505 cocaine mm. 511 dunhill and coffee more ice and shivas <laughs> cocaine grass to take the Ooh. edge off woody oh. creek cavern cocaine How? look at his lunch How? heineken's two margaritas two cheeseburgers Two orders of fries, a plate wow. of tomatoes, coleslaw, taco salad, a double order of onion rings, carrot cake, ice cream, Jeez. bean fritters, Dunhill, another Heineken, <laughs> cocaine, and for the ride home, a snow cone. <laughs> God, I feel like a nerd. I mean, so like how, did, is that real, real, real? I, th I think so. I think that's why he's dead. Maybe. when? How old did he go? He killed himself. Okay. Like yeah. at 40 or something? No, 50? I think he was like 73. He may have the human body. That's the thing is I think that maybe Winston Churchill inadvertently killed more people than Hitler. He might Accidentally. Because <laughs> people go, oh, they're really ever, well, Winston Churchill made it to 90. Yeah. He ran, he ran the British Empire in 92. What are you talking about? So that he might have accidentally, oh, 67? That's yeah. a little, that's a little. 
67. He, uh, yeah. Well, what would you like if you had, if you had no, no overdose, no nothing, no, no like no repercussions. Yeah. You don't, you don't feel it tomorrow. Yeah. What would be your ideal day of just straight partying? Like partying. Uh, I, you know, I really, and this might be kind of weird to say, cause my wife says it's not, doesn't make sense by bio, yeah. biologically. I don't like if I drink a couple lager beers yeah. on an empty stomach, say a poolside, I get very relaxed and kind of buzz. But if I drink whiskey or even wine or even IPAs, I get more altered, but not high. So that's a governor on me. I only really? get high from lighter beer. Why is that? I get altered, but I don't get high. Well, I have that with tequila. I get altered, but I, I don't enjoy it as much as I do yeah. a beer buzz. There's a couple times a year I'll order a martini. Yeah. You know, like, cause it's so cool. Yeah. And then I, I just immediately want the beer, you know? Yeah. So we, on those last weekends, we would run cause we were runners and then we'd, get a cabana so wait okay so wait you'd run how many how far well would you we run? were then vegas usually be on the treadmill we do an hour on the treadmill yeah you know we we're all lightweight i'm in my 30s this is why i had money and i'm treating everybody yeah and then we would go to the get the cabana and have you know women with, like this yeah with with just coronas so we probably have like eight ten of them over a few hours laughing our asses off yeah and then that and lunch and then a nap and it'd be a lot of beer. A lot of, a lot of beer. Cold beers are the but, best. But you know, I had, you know, mushroom, a couple mushroom trips that really? I really enjoyed. I only did it twice, but you know, we, we went down, we we're in front of the Queen Mary and uh, the Spruce yeah, Goose yeah. and we're out in a little cafe. I saw the Spruce. I was in yeah. Spruce Goose. The Spruce Goose now is up in, it's up uh, in Oregon. Oregon. I yeah. went, I went in Spruce Goose. It was pretty, uh, pretty crazy. So we dropped. We had the mushrooms and it's coming on to us. It's a little upset something. So then we're having Heineken's and stuff. So then we're looking at the placard advertising. Wait, who are you with? Your brother and your, uh, your buddies? High school buddies yeah. and buddies, you know. And so we're all first time mushrooms. Starting to kind of laugh. And then we saw the placard. It was advertising the Queen Mary. And everything for, was size ratio. Like how much could fit inside to show you how big the smokestacks are. Yeah. Like a hundred million bumblebees could make their home. And that's, you know. So then we laughed so hard. 3,000 grizzly bears could fit in the hall. So then we went down the rabbit hole with that. So we walked around the corner. And we saw this gigantic wooden plane. Twice the size of a 740. And yeah. just, just gales of laughter. We yeah. just laughed for hours. And then we went golfing near the near the 405 with orange golf balls yeah and we're really on mushrooms at this point <laughs> and then we look up and the goodyear blimp is right on top of us and it lands and then we go in i try to get i get on the phone because i'm pretty high but i'm not drunk i try to get the goodyear blimp to give us a ride around town yeah it's like a private thing you know? so, by the way could, could i've we? ridden on the goodyear blimp yeah and then we went to it's the, fucking terrifying really oh it's Fucking You're just terrifying. hanging up there? No, 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 no. It's fucking <laughs> terrifying. Do you, is there a picture of me in the Goodyear blimp? I We went in the Goodyear blimp oh, over really? by down in Long Beach. Funny. And it goes, It uh, is, there's got to be a picture of me there somewhere. Mm -hmm. So we, it, it, it takes off. It just sort of goes And like it goes that. like this. It goes. And oh. so you're looking up at the sky oh, it really but you're, it, oh it, i see the angle it, it goes yeah. at such a steep angle that you're like what the fuck and you're well, not, everything in the thing slides back everyone slides and then when you go to land it's fucking the hindenburg they're like and <laughs> i was <laughs> losing my fucking shit damn i lost okay. my shit well i dodged a bullet that yeah, day <laughs> they couldn't they wouldn't it give us was a ride terrifying funny they have a fucking rope out front to like. So they kind of wrangle it in. Well, I think it judges with wind and and then. But watching that rope when you oh, come yeah. up when you when you take off and the rope hits you in the face. It was. Did you ever have a Hindenburg joke or bit about no, the Hindenburg? No. I did one once and it bombed so bad on the Tonight Show. Jay's like, yeah, we can take that out if you want to. <laughs> what was the joke? <laughs> it was just ridiculous, a horrible joke. It was just the idea that famous radio guy. Oh my God, that guy. Yeah. The humanity, it's coming, blowing up. But what if it had been filled with helium instead of hydrogen? <laughs> oh, my God, the plane again. You know, this is that <laughs> joke. But it just laid there. The audience went, what? Oh, we should take a blimp when we're in Germany. Blimps are pretty yeah. surreal. 
Yeah, I would say the Germans, German technology, if they're like their cars, yeah, probably be an incredible. But yeah. we don't go straight up like the Americans. We well, float hey, up gradually. I've got to have you on the podcast when we have the new studio. You have to come over. I will. We'll do it yeah. later in the day so we can kill some beers. Yeah, I would do that. Yeah, I'd have this a few beers. A blast. This is, you are, yeah, this is awesome. You Sorry, are so, you know, so you know, it's so funny, you, uh, like guys like you and 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 Dennis Miller and Spade, Spade. you guys are such really? legends to us. And then we ha I hang out with you guys and I just forget, I forget how much you meant to me when I was like a kid watching you guys do comedy, mm -hmm. watching you guys be on SNL, watching you guys make movies. And then when I sit next to you, I forget just how fucking talented you guys are, how much further you are talent wise than guys like me and Tom. I have been uh, fucking laughing that. this entire fucking episode. But I don't really, you know, like when I was on SNL and I was like maybe 33 at the time, Sandler shows up. He's 23, looks 12. Yeah. And I just talked a little bit and saw him and just immediately liked him and immediately felt like he was a peer. Yeah. Same thing now. I don't think like, hey, you're 50. Listen, yeah. to, I'll show you this is done, yeah. kid. <laughs> no, I've but seen you're so many people. So fucking funny. You are so fucking funny. Well, that's and it's and it's it's so so valuable and like especially like I, my daughters understand that the currency in our households humor. So yeah. like, it, if if something's funny, it means a lot to us. So like, oh yeah. So that like they're. And and it's so funny. I you you hang out with so many comics where mm -hmm. your conversations turn into conversations about what are you getting paid in Omaha? Yeah. Whereas mm -hmm. what? Hey, did you have to do radio over right. there? It's yeah. so, it's such a business. Yeah, that to laugh with a comic. I'll, is, I'll tell you one last thing before we, because this is more into the romance of it and, yeah. and the true core of it is that when our rough and tumble family, if, if Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein was on, or later on Monty Python or the Beatles. Everything was about how much they fucking affected our lives and Pink Floyd and just the art, yeah. you know, television, film and music. And like, so then when I got into comedy, it was just like the feeling of wanting to transfer that and pay it back. You know, it was like wanting oh. to be great and really destroy the audience and, you know, and just make them make something so potent and so memorable and make them helpless because that's how I was with my idols. And so that is so, sort of the dream. Oh, you, Un underneath all the money, the fame, the power, all that shit. The dream is like to really have people go, I, I haven't laughed that hard. Oh, you've Or made my friends and I don't go, you know, skinheads from Maine is our, one of our, that was on the Dana Carvey show. Yeah. Me and, you know that sketch? Yeah. yeah Me and Colbert. Yeah. Guys oh, from yeah, New yeah, Hampshire yeah, yeah, that were yeah, racist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How you doing there? Yeah, well, the weather is the only thing the Jews don't control. You know, it was just, it was about race. But anyway, so then someone's saying that's a touchstone for my peer group. And even now when I do the weird place with the kids or I love it when people share stories or share stuff that I do. Yeah. And that is their inside joke for their peer group. So that's still the core Dude, romance of you, it. You were the inside joke for so many different of my peer groups. So many different of my peer groups. You were the joke. Like- I, and I mean, if you That's if, cool. if you're well, wondering, I feel really good, dude. Oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, what are you doing there? Damn. That's a great documentary, hate, hate by the way. Phobic. That's a great documentary. It was. Josh Greenbaum took a while to convince me and Smigel to do it, but he 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 made it great, and it it did heal some wounds on that thing. That's a much what was longer the thing? story. What was the thing? It came out the day of nine eleven or something. No, it just it just came on ABC and followed like it followed. home improvement. Yeah. And our first sketch was Clinton opens his shirt and he has he has teats as if he's gonna <laughs> and then he milks puppies like yeah, he's yeah. the mother of the nation. And the ratings were like sixteen million and they have the graph and it just went like that. <laughs> and then we got kind of tagged as like a blue show and then it just trundled along and it, we had such an A team and it was brilliant, really. Uh Colbert, Carell. Louis Dino Stepanopoulos. Yeah. Because he got nominated for the Grammy. I think, isn't he on Cancel? Didn't he win the Grammy for Best Comedy? He won the, he won the uh, Grammy for Best. Aren't uh, you on Cancel at that point? Kind of. I think so. I, I mean, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't even. I I'm a second say, chance guy, yeah. you know, I'm, yeah, I'm, a, I'm yeah. a due diligence, you know, yeah. I'm a constitutional guy. I yeah. Know. I mean, I, look, Louis has been so good to me my entire career that, I mean, he's just been a sweetheart to me and Tom. He's helped us so much that, you know, and he, uh, even when I did this special, he watched my hour and Kate gave me notes and, yeah. and then, and then I told him his notes completely fucked me up 
because he's like, I love this one joke. And, and then because he liked it, he's like, that's my favorite joke. I put so much energy in making it better and better and better yeah. that I fucked it up. And then I had to bail on it. And then I, and then I just was like, I was like, what, what did you like about it? Because now it doesn't work. And he was like, oh, it's just simple. And I went, so I should no, do it the way you did it back then? Him and I, I think Tom... Uh, has some bits too that are you know you're kind of like you don't really want to watch them because like yeah. now you can't think of that <laughs> yeah. he's thinking something that ah just hanging there and Louis same thing he would come up with stuff I mean it's not special he does he does this brilliant bit of, about Goodwill Hunting yeah with Matt Damon mm-hmm. that's like so inspired and make that yeah. work for everybody so it's 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 great stand ups are really really fun. Dude, to watch, but you're the best. Anyway, Thank we'll take a break. This. We'll be right back. <laughs> you're on. I just I do this because hey, I wait. Need, no, wait. What do you have? Do you have any? Are you on tour at all? Well, I just want to tell you, you're on podcast podcasts, and I, my guest today has been Bert Crasher. No, <laughs> I'm not on tour. I'm just uh, more fly on the wall. And nice. the, weir- the weird place is out there. It's just. Well, we've had Spade as a guest. Bear Spade's been on my podcast. I got to have you come be on my podcast. And everyone check out Fly on the Wall. It's a great fucking podcast. And my, weir- my episode hasn't released yet, has it? No. So very, it'll be coming out very soon. Very soon. You'll be yeah. on the episode. It was during Sober October. Yeah. So you'll see a Bert. You, you seem completely the same. Same Bert. <laughs> same Bert. Anyway, thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you, Peace brother. out. Bert and Tom. Tom and Bert. One goes topless while the other wears a shirt. Tom tells stories and Bert's the machine. There's not a chance in hell that they'll keep it clean. Here's what we call Two Bears One Cave. No scripts, a bit of booze, amateur partology. Dirty jokes, raunchy humor, no apologies. Here's what we call Two Bears One Cave. 